process advisory committee. And by the way, Tony, you probably would not want to be on it if you're planning to run for city council <laughs> for district two. Well, um, no, I'm not. I'm not planning to run for a district seat. I'm going to wait till the next at large. So. Okay. Well, um, it's it, since I'm not running myself, uh, that's what's open. But we're going through a process. The city clerk is redrawing the district maps, um, the city council district maps, I should say, um, and they do that every four years uh, ahead of the um, uh, the city council elections. So we're supposed to be done, or the city clerk's supposed to be done by November, and, and there's an advisory committee that's providing um, feedback on the proposed maps and, uh, or proposed boundaries for those districts. Uh, and so, um, so I've been assisting, I'm the representative for district two, which is the Northeast, North part, Colorado Springs. And I'm collecting it, feedback. Has there been any discussion about trying to move that date because doing it in November before the before that election in April is really short period of time for those who are on the edges. I know last time I was thinking about running in district when I lived down down south a little further. I was thinking about running in district six, and then they re redistricted it and moved me into one. And this was after like six months of planning to run in district six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not good, as you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're supposed to <laughs> there's supposed to be, um, uh, but there is a process. But the city code and the charter, I think it's the code, specifies when that information is supposed to be done. But definitely, the sooner the better. Right. The chart the charter does say, and that's why I'm saying, is there any discussion on looking to change that at any point? Uh, in the charter. Yeah, I know it'd be take a vote, but it would probably be a worthwhile vote. That's a good suggestion. Uh, I'm helping or assisting preparing a report back to the city clerk. And one of the recommendations, one of the suggestions is maybe we need to go back and revisit the city code and clarify, tighten up the language. Uh, the city clerk, uh, Sarah Johnson, would like to do that. But that's a good suggestion. Perhaps that's not enough time for people to get prepared. And maybe it should be October or maybe earlier. But the sooner the better. I have to agree with you there. November may be a little a little late and we got a late start just because of the COVID and the public health order. Uh, we had to do everything virtually and it, it just uh, was, we just added time to, to the whole process. That's a good suggestion. If you have, if you have that, please, please send me that comment and I'll, I'll ensure that uh, it gets to the, gets in our report as, as a recommendation. Let's, let's consider moving the state earlier uh, to give people a chance to prepare because we're a big city now. We're a big town. <laughs> you know, almost a half a million people and preparing for a very large council districts. If what are we, 38th or 39th in the nation now? Something like that? Yeah, we're pretty high. We're about, we're going to be, you know, we're almost a half a million in Colorado Springs and six council districts. You represent some pretty big areas. Yep. So being prepared is definitely a good suggestion. I'll, I'll, I'll add that to the report. So thank you. Yep. Carlos. Yes, sir. I have a question. I have a question. It's me, Reverend Williams. Are, is there any consideration to wait on that redistricting until after you get the uh, census report? No, it's not tied to the U.S. Census at all. Um, the U.S. Well, census will, will come out in July, and that's too late because the city council elections are in April. I understand that. But what I'm saying is you have a more accurate count because of the flow of people how do you count for the fact that more people like tony or yeah tony just said he was moved out of one district into another but literally the population is shifting so that your council district and i assume you're trying to make each district approximately equal in number of Correct. Uh, voters and i don't even know if the census shows even whether you're a voting age because I think they just count you a body whether you're two or 202. One of the problems Reb is is like he said it's done every four years so it doesn't line up with the census at all. Um, well, it would make sense to do it every 10 years based on the census do it like a year or two after the census but we don't do a lot of stuff in this city that makes sense. So Well the county doesn't do it by census <laughs> either don't get me wrong because they do it every four years and they the county clerk does it, but he takes into account the flow of people from one area to the other. So yeah, that's a little different. Uh, the city council districts are, are are defined by population, whereas the county clerk, when they come up with their precinct boundaries, for example, 
um, those are by voters. So there's population for the city and then for the county, it's the voting, the voters. And there are some places that uh, have, you know, fewer voters compared to their population. Places in the right. Southeast and so forth where they have oh, just a lot of young people there who are not voters. Hi there, I wanted to check and see who we have on the line at uh, 352-2103. Hi, Jason. Thank you. Yeah, for everybody on the line, yeah, just go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll send out uh, a, just a message maybe to Rick if he wants it. This is kind of a side side thing, but if you guys want to chime in, yeah, please reach out to me and we'll we'll discuss it. <laughs> Redistricting. Jim, I think everybody on our end is good to go. So whenever you want to call it, we'll do the roll call when you're ready. Um, okay, so um, good discussion. Um, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, and if you would take roll, that would be great, Jessica. Thank you. All right, no problem. So I'm going to go down the list of attendees, and then if I miss anybody that's a voting member or a um, committee member, just let me know, and I can make sure to mark you. Um, so I see Tony, Joan, Reb, um, Ann Ash, Brian, Ann Nichols, uh, Jim, Tom, Jean, Carlos, Rick Hoover, Cheryl, Richard Robertson, Rick Sonnenberg, Beverly, um, staff of member governments and citizens. Is there any members that I did not call that I missed? You get Richard? Uh, Richard Robertson, yes. Okay. So at this point, all alternates can vote. Uh, but we will have to pay attention to uh, late arrivals. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, um, thank everyone for your time and for being here. Um, hope everyone is uh, continuing to stay safe and that families are, are safe as well. Um, and again, thank you for your time. Um, so our item number two, um, approval of the agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda? I move. So moved. So move and, move. and we have a second from Joan. Who was uh, the motion? I'm sorry. And if you guys could just make sure to state your name when making the motion so that we capture it properly, that'd be super helpful. Um, Tom Viersba on Thanks, the motion. Tom. Um, <clears throat> um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. <clears throat> the agenda is approved. Item number three, public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, any of the committee members have anything to say that's not on the, our agenda? Any members of the public? Um, I would like to make one. You guys were talking about um, city elections and Carlos mentioned uh, Connect COS. Um, <clears throat> I am on that community advisory committee um, for Connect COS. Um, and I would just like to encourage um, you guys to um, go to colorsprings.gov, uh, .gov, Connect COS. Um, there's a public survey out there, um, and Connect COS is part of uh, the planning network uh, and part of, the, of the master planning for uh, Colorado Springs. And um, it's been about 20 years since they've uh, updated this. Um, and it's for transportation related uh, issues and infrastructure and whatnot. So um, you're obviously interested in that kind of subject or you wouldn't be on this committee, I hope. Um, so I encourage you to go to Connect COS, take that survey and provide your input. So um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, in, <clears throat> yes. I just want to mention, I, I took that survey and it's, uh, it's an interesting survey and it's going to be very, very helpful. Um, and it's a survey that you're going to be glad you're going to be, have input on. Thank you, Rick. Um, um, I've take I have a question. This is Joan. I'm assuming that it's a poll for just city residents only. I mean, I live in the county. I, I don't know that it's limited, Joan. Okay. Um, 
I, I'm not aware that it's limited, that they ask you where you live or whatever. Rick, do you remember? I don't remember seeing anything where it's limited to uh, city only. Yeah, it's- Okay, it's, well, I'll check it out. It's a regional transportation plan, a regional uh, master plan for transportation. So I would imagine that uh, anyone transiting or working around and through the city would be welcome. Okay, thank you. Joan, real quick, I can tell you that um, there is a map on the um, um, on the survey, and it does include your area out there in Colorado Center. Oh wow! Thanks, they found Brian. us. <laughs> now that we know where you live. Yeah. All right. So, uh, item number four: approval of minutes from the August fifth uh, meeting. Um, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. And Cheryl. That was Cheryl. Okay. Second, Joan. Um, <clears throat> all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Don't see any opposed. I hear any opposed. Um, okay. So financial reports, um, Bev. Hey, good afternoon. Well, we had another good month in June. We received ten million eight hundred and fifty-four thousand. So we were one million eight hundred and eighty-six ahead of the monthly budget, or twenty-one percent. And then we were um, one million twenty-five thousand ahead of the June of last year, or ten point four percent. And this month, this, these figures do not include um, very much catch-up at all from prior periods. So we had a pretty good month, probably because of the stimulus and things opening up a little bit. So, are there any questions on the financials? Okay, are we ready to go on to the next item? Jim, you're Jim, muted. You're muted, Jim. There we go, sorry. Can you hear me now, Bev? Yeah, yeah, Were the, oh. are there any questions um, concerning the financials? Yeah, I had a question. Okay. Um, I mean, this is, this is great news, um, but it's counterintuitive. Um, that that we would have this kind of report um, given the circumstances. And so is there any indication or do you have any insight at all into um, what categories this falls into? Is this, I mean, is it like car sales? Is it construction? Housing. Uh, housing? It, it's really both car sales and construction and a lot of retail and a ton of online sales, but I don't necessarily get to see what's online and what's not online. But um, in talking to the state and um, Colorado Department of Revenue, and I talked to um, somebody at El Paso County and they're experiencing the same thing. Now, you know, one of the things you have to keep in mind is the stimulus for COVID was, you know, pretty robust and that's going to, that's ending or it has ended parts of it and some parts of it haven't, but there was um, a key thing was $600 extra a week of unemployment benefits. And for some people that's more than they made. So they had their unemployment and the extra $600 a week. And you know, you keep them cooped up for a month and then you let them all out and you know, it's, it's a spending spree. <laughs> yeah, well, I've seen a lot of um, temporary tags on vehicles. There's a lot of vehicles running, new vehicles running around. So I was just curious, and so that um, um, managing expectations, that, you know, that if stimulus now coming to an end, is it, re and we're going into our budget season and budget formulation period, um, do we, uh, 
and we can talk about this in the next item, I guess, but <clears throat> do we, do we uh, react to this uh, additional funding by, by allocating more or do we play it conservative uh, until we see what uh, a couple more months of the tail end of this thing and as the stimulus dries up and see, see what happens then. So I guess that kind of transitions into your next item. Well, bit. yeah, and as far as next year's budget figure, I think we need to be conservative because now that things are, um, the stimulus package isn't going to be as robust and um, unemployment, well, for one thing also, another thing is the banks might start foreclosing on things if um, they're allowed to. Right now, they're not supposed to be foreclosing on people, and there's just a lot that next year could bring that isn't all positive. And then the uncertainties with um, a change in leadership, the uh, elections and so on, we just really won't know what next year will bring and we're just gonna have to budget conservatively. Okay. Jim and Bev, this is Larry. Uh, doesn't quite match the tag that's on my picture there on the computer, but um, one comment I'd like to make is I've read several articles that uh, indicate with the Supreme Court ruling last year on collection of sales tax. You know, before, if you ordered something from Amazon in Colorado Springs, they would not um, collect any sales tax for that particular item. And now, all across the country, um, all taxing authorities do have the capability of taxing anything that is ordered and shipped online, which uh, from the articles I've read, I mean, it's not a large amount, but it is an amount that's being added to the sales tax revenues in all taxing authorities. Right, and we are receiving that. And then we received some catch up because that law changed last year and some, some entities weren't reporting it. So this year we have about, oh, I'd say about $3 million worth of catch up in our total so far. That's pretty significant. So we'll be not counting that as going to happen again. It's, that's done. And it wouldn't be happening again next year. So our sales and use tax budget for next year is not going to be what we think we're going to end up with this year necessarily. Right. Jim, this is Brian West. Go ahead, Brian. Um, just to give some insights on the, the local um, housing and construction, uh, which is gonna affect, uh, we've been seeing shortages of lumber uh, due to supply chain issues and, and not just lumber, but basically all kinds of housing things. Um, I've been dealing a lot with, uh, uh, with a client who's uh, doing a, a finishing up a new build and um, the builders uh, that I've been talking to are looking at um, a May timeframe for delivery right now with possible more delays. What that means is normally um, you, can, you can expect a you know, three to six month delivery. Uh, now they're looking seven to 10 months and beyond. Uh, I just dealt with a client who uh, contracted on their house last November uh, from a dirt start and their um, scheduled delivery date is just got pushed out again. And we're almost a year from the, from when they contracted. So what we're seeing is there's a lot of supply chain issues um, that are going to uh, impact uh, sales and, and also the, uh, you know, places like Lowe's and Home Depot. Uh, I've got a neighbor who, uh, was building a deck and he can't complete it because there's not the lumber available to do what he needs to do. So mm -hmm. we're starting to see these issues. I've got a client right now who we've, um, uh, he had a foreclosure. Um, he's deployed military and uh, he was, he was going to be foreclosed on in June. And of course the moratorium uh, was going on at the time. So it got pushed out to November we don't know yet what's gonna happen, but we've been seeing 
um, in my capacity as, as vice chair of the El Paso County Homeless Veterans Coalition, we've started to see these housing issues uh, begin to begin to affect things. So I think we might have been, uh, we might be seeing, uh, depending on what happens here in the next few months with the election, uh, we could see either a, uh, a continued recovery, but I think some of the issues that we might have experienced early on got pushed off. Um, and unless things flesh out here, um, we could we could still see that downturn. So I think caution uh, is still advised. Yeah. Okay. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. Um, any other questions for Bev before we move on to the 2021 budget calendar? Thank you, Bev, for that information. So for the 2021 calendar, the attachment it looks very similar to last year's, and it follows some. Um, uh, all the government regulations for a government entity. So I'm looking for approval for that uh, recommendation to the board for approval. Mr. Chair, I have a uh, question. Go ahead, Carlos. Uh, yeah, uh, item for the calendar, uh, the draft budget presented to the board, that's uh, November 11th. That is a uh, Veterans Day, that's a holiday. Does that have any uh, implications on this calendar? Maybe that's a question for Bev or for Rick. Good okay, I don't know so if the office is going to be open or not, but uh, or we just put a footnote in there, this date may be adjusted. Okay, so yeah, yeah, we're going to have to do that. Do do what? Put a footnote in there or change the date? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what the date will be adjusted to. I should have noticed that. That's why I'm here. Now, wait, are you saying November 11th? Yes. Okay. 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 So then, I don't have my calendar. Right in front of me. Yeah. If you want to just check it or. Um, yes. We well, actually, have, I'm sorry. We'll have to ask the board to change it either to Tuesday or Thursday. Yeah, that's true. Okay. We will. Um, I'll put a footnote on this to the board or let them know and we will ask them, thanks Carlos, to confirm a new date so that I can reissue this. <clears throat> Great, good catch. Car good That's catch. a good catch. So yeah, we'll get that then a new date uh, confirmed next Wednesday at the board meeting and then change the calendar. Then I recommend the approval of the uh, budget calendar with the amended uh, footnote. Or I'll, second the, uh, that. Or, I'll second that. Second. Tony Joya. Uh, and Tony Joya seconded. Yes. Well, thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Item number six, capital maintenance and public transportation contract, City of Colorado Springs. Who's going to speak to that today? Good afternoon, this is Mike Chavis. Uh, the first item we have actually is a line item request uh, memo. So we have uh, four projects we'd like to start on on the A-list that have not been funded previously. So that's 8th Street Improvements, El Paso County Road Bridge, Over Fountain Creek, the I-25 ramps at South Nevada and Tejon, and a South Cheyenne Canyon Bridge replacement. So we are requesting some funds to get those going here. We're also requesting some additional funds into the Galley Road over West Porcasan Creek Bridge Project. We're in the design of that. We had, this is a project last year that we found a little bit of money to get the project going, but we need a little bit more to continue the design. So in my memo, I have a table that shows uh, where we're taking the money from. Uh, we have combined the Platte Avenue corridor study and the I-25 connection together. We are thinking we're not gonna need uh, the 2.3 million. We think we're gonna do it for less. So we're gonna transfer out the $200,000 out of that project. And then the rest of the money is coming out of the Barnes Road improvements 
that was a project that we started last year. We got really good bids on it, and we, you know, we were still reserving some money in the, in that project, but we're freeing up uh, the rest of it to fund the projects uh, that are on the table. Hey, you're taking about a million bucks out of that Barnes Road project, so you still think you've got enough to keep that going? Yes, um, we had really supplemented that budget before we went to construction, and it came in quite a bit lower than we thought. So uh, cool. we're in good shape on that one. Cool. Well, it's progressing. It's progressing pretty well. Um, so um, uh, it's a big project in a very busy area. So yeah. <clears throat> any, any questions on this? Any questions on the line item transfer from the city? Um, do I have a motion to approve the city's request for line item transfers? Gene Bray, so moved. Um, Viersba, second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, okay, Mike, your other uh, contracts? Okay, so we have uh, several items for review today. The first item is actually a change order for Stantec Consulting for the Galley Road uh, Bridge Project, which we just approved a line item transfer. Uh, this will just help us continue with the final design. Uh, there's a, a new state requirement that we do quite a bit of utility uh, location and engineering and confirmation. So the change order for Stantec is to, to help that effort to locate utilities, do some pot hauling, and then there's a little bit of design uh, that goes along with what that utility work. Next item we have is we've Mike, got a, yes, sir. Mike, could I ask two questions? Sorry, I didn't get that. I had my thing muted and I couldn't understand. In, okay. your, trans, in your transfers, that million or $950,000 that you're tra transferring, how much is that of the original budget? How much quote did you miss because of extra bit, extra good bidding? And I think there, as I recall, there were some design changes. Well, uh, well, basically, we had a, a cost estimate going in before we bid, so um, we supplemented that for the Barnes budget to about six million, and uh, just because based on the estimate we had. But when we got the actual bids, it was substantially less. So we're looking at uh, being, we're thinking we're going to finish that whole project for about three and a half million. Um, and that's, there's some money in reserve in that three and a half million uh, for anything that might come up as they're working. So that, that pro project budget has been reduced substantially. Well, we're looking at PPRTA3 and you want to change some things and how accurate the budgets are, or the estimates are, prior to even having an idea. And yet this one is like, you said it's about three and a half million and you thought it was six. That's a heck of a difference. And there's a, a certain board member that's the one pushing the buttons on it. I'm just asking, what, that's why I was asking. Well, you know, what the, cost estimates that we've been getting are, are from the engineers. This Barnes happened to have just good bids. I mean, we weren't really expecting. We always want the bids to come in, you know, around what the engineer estimates are, but Barnes happened to come in quite a bit lower and that, and then the Platte Avenue, which we opened up bids recently also came in lower. So that's a good trend. And it's, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the consultants aren't going to, they're not going to assume that we're going to get bids. They're going to go with the best uh, data they have. And if the market is shifting, that, that's good for us. So in this case, in the Barnes case, it wasn't so much that we were off or it's just that we had a, a bidder who was new to the city and he came in with a good price. And we, we hope to continue seeing that, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as, when, we, when we get to the quarterly reports, will address uh, some items that will help us hone in not only on our current projects, but we'll be using those same uh, methodologies to be uh, pricing future projects so that we're more, more in the ballpark. 
but we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that in the quarterly report section. All right, uh, now back to the one, that item one, Galley Road over Sand Creek. Uh -huh. You said you have to do additional pothole and some utility work. And yes. it, how, how did it come about that you had to do more? Because it says now you're gonna come out 90%, I think 90% complete on your engineering. Where did I see that? Well, we're, we're in final design. So we're, we're, we're not at 90, but we're headed toward that. But there is a, a new requirement that construction plans have a, what they call a subsurface engineering uh, to uh, subsurface underground engineering. And so basically the consultants have to certify that the utilities that are shown are as accurate as possible. And there's a certain, there's different levels and we're required to do a level B, which is pretty precise. And that's just something that came down from the state in, in I think in 2019 and it's, uh, it uh, requires a fair amount of work, uh, and it's it's one of those state mandates that, you know, anytime there's a mandate, it's, it, it costs, and that's an unfortunate thing. So as we got from preliminary to final, uh, you know, the consultants uh, presented a, a scope of work and a fee to, to do this additional required work, and that's what this change order is for. Gene Bray with a question. Uh huh. Yes. Do you have any idea how they're going to reroute fiber optic cables there? Whether they're going to be on on conduit with the box culvert or what? Uh, no. I can get with you later. I'm sure they're, you know, they'll reroute them uh, in some manner. But I'm not familiar with the, how they're doing that right now. All right. If if you could either pass that on to me or have someone that's knowledgeable pass it to me, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. <clears throat> Any other questions for Mike on that project? Go ahead, Mike, and finish. Okay, next time we have a change order for Kiewit on the Southwest Downtown Bridge. And we actually uh, are uh, gonna deduct some RTA money out of the construction contract and supple or, or replace it with uh, a gift trust that we got from uh, somebody who granted some money to the city for, for the uh, city of champions projects. And also we're going to add some URA bond money to it. Now that deduction of RTA funds, uh, we're looking at using that to uh, do some uh, geotechnical work that needs to be done during construction and also to pay some of the railroad flagging costs, which we've talked about in, the past that are pretty substantial. So we're still looking at staying under that $4.6 million, but we're just going to uh, reallocate the RTA money from the, from the bridge job to some other expenses. Oh, darn. I thought we were going to actually see a reduction in the bridge to nowhere. It's from nowhere, Jim, not to. Oh, got it. Got it. Sorry. Uh, any, uh, okay. Next item is, uh, we are moving into the final design portion of the Academy Boulevard reconstruction. And there's two segments, uh, Bijou to Airport and Fountain to Milton Proby Parkway. For the design effort, we've actually just combined it. So uh, we got a, a, a scope and fee from AECOM to, to go to the final design. And it's, uh, what was it, 2.5 million. And I've shown how we're breaking it up here uh, between the two projects. Uh, hey, Mike. Mike. Oh, Mike, go yeah. ahead. Sorry, Rick. Here we go. Go yeah. Go ahead, Rick. It's, oh, it's Brian. I'll go next. Okay, thank you. I wanted to step back to the bridge. Uh huh. Uh, I thought that came from the Greenway. Is there a problem with transferring that out of the out of one aspect into a different one into roadways? No, no, the, the the Greenway Fund is paying for bridge and bridge related item. So it, it's. But you're reducing the funds that we've committed to the bridge, which came out of the Greenway, and you're putting it into, uh, into the road? In the no, road? no, no, no. The, this, the, the RTA money will be used for bridge related items. Uh, 
railroad costs because we're constructing over the railroad. Oh, okay. And, and some geotechnical work related to the bridge. Okay, thanks. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Brian. Um, uh, real quick, and and uh, um, Rick already kind of got uh, th that question out of the way. But the other question I had is, I was trying to find a figure that we're at for uh, the, uh, as Jim called it, the bridge to nowhere, um, which is now a bridge to somewhere, but uh, it's also, um, from what I can tell, substantially over the original budget projection, at least at least from what I've been able to gather, which is kind of, it, it's, it's kind of difficult to find out where we're actually at on that. Now, last, the last number I saw was like 17 million. Is that right? Yeah, I remember that number. Uh, what I'll do is I'll actually have an update next month, kind of show where we're at. And I think, you know, we've been, Ryan Phipps is working on that. And he's been really, real hard to, to stay, you know, in there within the budget, the overall budget that includes other money. But uh, we'll just bring an update, kind of show where we're at. Uh, again, you know, Rick Sonnenberg is also uh, tracking this and, you know, he's a, uh, bird dogging that we don't exceed that 4.6 of our team so that that would let be, me bring that, an update yeah that up that update would be great thanks so much mike mike what is the schedule right now for their erection they're looking at putting uh the bridge in place at the end of september um and then uh then they actually have to do some more work on the bridge but i think we're looking at having the bridge complete and open in the in the spring and we'll, we'll have an updated schedule next month too with that but we will uh, we will also notify uh, the board or our, Rick because I think they're going to have a, like a, a, a viewing uh, opportunity when they put the bridge in place it ought to be I some just, make sure you serve some wine with it <laughs> <laughs> expensive wine yeah, no I'd kidding. like to just take photographs. Hell with that. I want whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the entire, this is Rick Seinberg. The entire CAC should have received an email from me indicating uh, a rough timetable and that the uh, communications director with the City of Colorado Springs, Kim Melkor, will send out uh, invitations to each and every one of you uh, showing where the VIP viewing box is going to be or, or location. So um, be watching for that uh, later this month. But yeah, it's uh, the, the rough schedules, the last couple, couple of days of September or the first couple of days of October is the rough schedule right now. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so was there any other or any questions on the Academy change order for design? Go ahead, Mike. Okay, next item we have uh, is actually a maintenance item. So we went out and are gonna got some bids to rehabilitate rehabilitate the deck on the Colorado Avenue Bridge, which goes over Monument Creek and the railroad. Uh, we um, also had a and let me let me give me a second to scroll to my memo. Um, we also did put out in that bid. An item to uh, finish the top off the deck with a polyester concrete topping, which is something that the bridge program has been using on bridges uh, because it's a, it's a very durable wear, wear uh, uh, what do you call it, topping. And uh, this is something that CDOT's also doing on their bridges. So we had two bidders and uh, we're looking for approval to award this contract for uh, $2.8 million. Mike, how does this constitute a uh, a rehabilitation is maintenance and not this? You know, it's a three million dollar contract. It's a round number, two point eight million dollar contract, and yet that's rehabilitation. That's maintenance. Uh, yeah. Now the um, I think if we we went through a um, uh, a while back, we went through an exercise where we identified capital and maintenance type items and and basically a, a uh, 
deck rehab and uh, you know wear coating are our maintenance items. Basically, this is something that will prolong the life of the bridge. So um, uh, that's why we're you know it comes under the maintenance category. Mike, I've got a question uh, relative the the new deck you're putting on there. Again, two inches thick, and even if it's with this polymer or whatever we're putting into it, doesn't the bridge flex enough that that two inches will simply disintegrate again? Uh, Aaron, I'll let you uh, answer that one. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, Aaron Egbert, City of Colorado Springs. Um, the, um, the, the material, and this is very technical, it's very sticky type stuff. <laughs> and we prepped the bridge deck. We're actually gonna go in and we did a, a full deck scan of this structure and we determined where the reinforcing steel was, was too high. It had kind of floated up during the original construction. So all those areas will be dug out and patched and then we'll come back and do this polyester concrete overlay and then taper it back to the joints so that we will catch at each one of the joints and we don't have to do any ADA improvements or replace the joints. Uh, but this material has worked really well. We did it Voyager over Kettle Creek was the first structure we used it on, and it's holding up very well. Uh, Chapel Hills over Pine Creek is another structure, uh, and we're really happy with how the product is working. Uh, years ago, or decades ago, we actually used a two-part epoxy overlay on this bridge deck, and if you drive out there today, you'll see where that epoxy overlay is starting to delaminate off that surface. So this will be a much more durable product uh, and it'll really extend the service life of those two bridges. What was the location of the bridge again? Uh, it's two, to go yeah, it's two structures. The first structure is just east of I-25 on Colorado. And then the second structure goes over uh, Caneos and the railroad. Okay, the, uh, the reason I ask is we did a, a Colorado Avenue bridge reconstruction years ago. And, and is, is this related or different? Uh, this bridge was replaced in the late 90s. Um, so it was called the Colorado Viaduct. Uh, is that the project you're thinking of? No, no, I'm talking about the one that was done as an emergency uh, project. Mm -hmm. That was, that, Cimarron. that was Cimarron, not Colorado. That Col was Cimarron? Okay, sorry, sorry, Cimarron, not Colorado. Okay. okay. Aaron, go back there and describe <laughs> where it was now. I thought it was the bridge that leads into America the Beautiful Park, goes over the railroad tracks. That's correct, it is. Yeah, one, one structure goes over the Canejos, and then it ties into that traffic signal at um, Chimino, down to America the Beautiful, and then there's another bridge over Monument Creek as you get closer to I-25. Goes under I-25. Yes, Colorado goes under I-25. Does that help, Reb? Did you get your answer, Reb? No, I, I don't quite understand where that is because I travel that every weekend going to Flor uh, Florissant and I don't know where that bridge is. From it's where, I think, I think we have a map in the, in, with the memo. This is a really nice map a little farther down. It's, it's from downtown going out to Colorado Avenue that goes out to old Colorado City. It's the bridge that goes across the railroad tracks where the building has the roof painted. On the yeah, north side of that. that. It starts uh, at the so Antlers Hotel and then it ends uh, underneath I-25 by the, you know, the glass place and Costco's it, metal recycling. By City Glass. Ends up by City Glass. Yeah. Okay. Under City, by City Glass, there's this, what's under, because that's underneath the interstate. Reb, the bridge goes across the creek and it goes across the railroad tracks. <clears throat> I'm going to have to stop and look. When I say that, I, you also go to PPRTA uh, meetings. We used to go that way, or I did. And I used to go to City Glass on a regular basis. I'm just not able. Okay, there's a map. There's a map in the packet. Just scroll past the. I don't the, have, <coughs> scroll. I don't have in my pack. Okay. 
All right, any, uh, you want to move on, Mike? Okay, next time we have is we've got a bridge removal uh, of the Cowpoke Bridge over Conway Creek. Uh, there's a section of Cowpoke out east that uh, there's a, a stormwater project and they're going to build a big detention pond and the pond is actually going to go where this, it's a dirt section of Cowpoke that's gone away. Uh, access that some of the properties were using before is going to be on Tut Boulevard. Uh, the, the stormwater project is extending Tut to the north. Um, and then uh, Tut will be continued on in the future by development. But this is a bridge that uh, we're, we no longer need. We've been maintaining it. We did some work on the in the creek a, a few years ago when there was some erosion. So this uh, this bridge is no longer needed. It's going to be coming off our maintenance work, and uh, so we kind of partner with Stormwater. So what we'll end up having is uh, the Stormwater project will build a Tut extension and they'll build a box culvert under Tut, which will convey uh, Conway Creek water. So uh, in working with uh, Stormwater, um, we actually got a price from their contractor that was less than uh, our on-call bridge ma maintenance contractor. Uh, so we're getting the savings here uh, in getting that bridge removed. And the reason that bridge maintenance is doing it is it's in our in our inventory. It's something we've been maintaining and it will help uh, save money in the future since we won't have to maintain this older bridge and we'll have a new bridge box culvert which being new and box culverts tend not to have as much work needed on them as bridges do so uh, so that's kind of the rationale for us doing this work hey mike i just wanted to ask real quick the the map was a little hard for me to place but i'm assuming this is the out towards the end there near Cumbra Vista? I believe so, Aaron. You, you, yeah, you, the, yeah, the subdivision that you're looking at to the south is Cumbra Vista. Okay, uh, that's what I was, that's what I assumed, but I wanted to make sure, thanks. Yeah, so this is north of Woodman where Tut goes out on the other side of the hospital and goes up that hill, and this is north of Woodman Road, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Godfrey, I did have this. Uh, Go ahead, Carlos. About to, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, this, see, um, and this is uh, within the city boundaries, correct? It's not in county property. Yeah, Carlos, this is Aaron. So, so this bridge was annexed into the city with Wolf Ranch, uh, Norwood development. So, yes, the the structure and the bridge is in the city limits. The uh, development, the Peacock Ranch, which is kind of on the north. I guess it'd be the northwest corner of this exhibit where you kind of see those existing outbuildings and structures that is still within the county. Yeah, it just gets confusing with the annexations and the jurisdictions here in this area. I just wanted to just ensure that this is a city, you know, within the purview of our, our city city budget here. All right, thank Gene, you. Gene Bray with a question. Go ahead, Gene. Um, old Cowpoke uh, Road or the old Cowpoke Bridge, that, where does that road end up terminating? Does it turn into Tut and dead end there? Or does it continue east of Tut? I'm sorry, west of Tut, past the gray area that you have drawn in that says Tut Road. So this, so the dirt section of Tut Road, uh, excuse me, of Cowpoke from Tut back to the east to where it ties into the paved area of Cowpoke that whole section of road is getting uh, uh, vacated and therefore there's no need for that bridge. Uh, so access for those uh, parcels of the county is going to go, is going to be on tut. So basically the gray, gray area uh, is where the stormwater project is extending tut to, uh, to those parcels. So there's access. And then in the future, the development will continue to tut on to the north. But that section uh, of Cowpoke uh, where the bridge is shown, that's no longer needed. Okay, I've been up in that area and the, the amount of work going on is impressive to say the least. Yeah, 
for sure. Thank you. I've got a question. You keep refer referring to using uh, where the bridge is right now and it's no longer going to be needing. Is going to be for stormwater detention by <clears throat> for the project to the north of it, right? Why is it PPRTA or just why is it PPRTA's problem to remove a bridge just because you get it off your list? Because you're basically being done for stormwater control. And I'd like to go aside just for a second. Jessica, I get my stuff online and these maps were not in my packet when I say that. I downloaded everything. Just information. They were in mine. Did you come offline with it and print it at home? I, I downloaded it and put it on my computer. Same, same here, same here, Reb. This is Larry. Uh, I, I'm with the others. Uh, I was able to download uh, everything from the email that Jessica sent and include all, all the maps and descriptions, including the one that we're looking at right now on Tut Pond vicinity map. All right, that's fine. Okay, and to get back to Reb's question, like I said, basically we, we partnered with Stormwater. This is a bridge that we are responsible for and uh, we just, uh, because we could get a, a good price with the stormwater contractor, we decided that uh, it would be an opportune time to, to get this bridge removed. It needs to come out for the project, but since uh, it's going to save us money in the long run, we, we just partner with Stormwater and, and uh, agreed to pay for the bridge removal. And like I said, we're getting that culvert, that blue uh, line there that's on Tut, that's the new culvert that uh, will be our responsibility, but it's going to be new. Uh, so, you know, it should be uh, some time before we have to put, it, you know, any kind of maintenance into it. So uh, we just thought it was, uh, you know, worthwhile to work with the stormwater and, and take this bridge out at uh, with the maintenance funds. Mike, I, I did. Uh, this oh. is Larry. Oh, am I? Someone else have a question? Go ahead, Larry, I'll wait. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, are they going to also remove the road on both sides of that culvert so that uh, we don't have somebody driving out there unauthorized and ended up uh, going in there? Uh, yes, I, I believe we are. I mean, uh, it, it'll, it'll, it, there, there'll be some grading. I mean, there'll be grading from the creek up that basically will take the road out. So the road will be gone um, and it, it'll, it'll be graded and, and you, it won't be drivable. Right, go ahead, Brian. Uh, Mike, uh, real quick, I wanted to find out, because uh, right now Tut abruptly ends uh, there. And then of course there's the ranch and then Tut picks up again over on the far side of the ranch. Um, do, do you have any uh, any intelligence or anything regarding uh, the ranch? Because I've seen cows out there regularly. So uh, my understanding is that that's, you know, that's not going to be available. No, I, I as far as development, I'm not real familiar with, with what's going on timing-wise. Aaron, do you, do you have any info? Well, I do know that the Peacock Ranch has been for sale for the last 20 years. Um, I just don't think anybody's wanted to, to pay as much as Ross is asking for it right now. But I think it's anticipated that it will uh, annex into the city at some point and connect into Wolf Ranch. Okay. Thank you. Otherwise, they're just cows poking around out there. Oh, ah, but um bum <laughs> Brian uh, Jean Bray. I've been up there within the last week to 10 days and inside that red area, there aren't any, any cows roaming anywhere. If they are, they're roadkill now with all the construction. There are cattle further north outside the red area and further west. Oh yeah, yeah. I wasn't talking about the the red area that's designated on our map. I was talking about a, a you know actually on the ranch itself to the to the uh, 
uh, on this, it would be kind of to the northwest. Yeah. Okay, Mike. The only okay. Line. Next item, uh, we have a maintenance uh, contract for a pipelining for uh, CMP pipes under roadways uh, in various parts of the city. Uh, it's a fair amount of pipe work, so pretty good sized contract. Um, I the memo lists the the streets that will be uh, worked on or the pipes on the streets. Uh, there's any other detailed questions I might need to defer to Corey or, or Dave if they're on the line. Okay, Airport Road. Okay, Airport Road. So this is not a contract, but basically when we started looking at replacing the airport bridge, uh, we're going to have to relocate a sanitary line that's in or under the bridge. And we had an initial cost estimate uh, of our a city RTA cost portion, about 324000 to move that um, sanitary line. And basically what they were going to do is just kind of uh, blow it around to the north side of the bridge. Um, and that wasn't a very good solution. You, you, CSU Utilities, they didn't really like that because it was kind of a flat grade when they bowed it around the bridge. So in their long-term planning, they need to upgrade the sanitary line coming down Academy, going on airport to the east, uh, to the west a little bit, and then it goes down uh, uh, Spring Creek uh, down the way. So they are looking at uh, rerouting the, the whole uh, line and upgrading as far as size is concerned. So we're actually working with them and they have uh, funded uh, this project uh, uh, that they're doing. Uh, but we need, uh, we need the city's portion of uh, contribution in for, uh, for the project. We're, we're actually having an RFP for this pipe work. If you look at the map, uh, I've got a, a black line that kind of shows where the, where the alignment of the sanitary is going to be going. And you see that we bring it to the south of the bridge. Um, the actual project is much longer. That's the, it's about a $4 million project. Uh, but what we're asking for is authorize, authorization to move what would have been our share of the sanitary relocation to be moved into a, a city account uh, where the CSU money is residing. And um, that just makes it easier for us to, to issue a contract uh, that's got one funding uh, source and we don't have to do an RTA contract and have multiple, you know, sending a, a pay request to the city and RTA. So we just wanna move the, the city's portion into the city CSU uh, utility account and get this project uh, done. So basically I, this is our portion that we would have been paying to move the sanitary out of the way of the new bridge. Mike, I witnessed, I travel that road on a daily basis and I witnessed the construction that was done by a former contractor, uh, actually the father was a former contractor of mine. The, and I want to say they put in a blue sanitary pipe, say sanitary. They had cast iron fittings, and there were valves that they installed. Is that the one? That I'm, and it was just done. It was done from the fire sta station to the east, all the way past and part way up. No, I, well, it didn't. It stayed on the golf course, right to the south of the golf course. But that was just put in less than two years ago. Well, I, I believe um, airport uh, was actually worked on it. It might have been paved up to the bridge, but not including the bridge because we knew we were going to replace it. So I think, believe CSU replaced the water line um, west of the bridge. Uh, so we're not going to be taking that work out, but we will tie into it uh, when we replace the bridge. Okay. I. I didn't think it was sewer line. I, that's what I'm saying. No, there, there is. No, new sewer line. It's, no, no, it's, 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 no, we just, uh, we did, see if you just did the water line because, uh, that, you know, that as part of the process when we were doing roadway maintenance, we, 
mainly overlay, we do have CSU look to see if we need to replace the water line so that they don't have to tear it up after we paved. So that work was done previously, but uh, utility work around the bridge was not done, and uh, we'll be rerouting the sanitary like around the show south south of the roadway and uh, get it out get it out of the way. And we want to do this because um, rather than them come in a couple of years and upgrade this line and tear up the road that we just built, we're just doing this. They're doing this work ahead of it so that it's in place for their future needs. Okay. My team, Bray. Oh, go ahead. A uh, couple of specific questions on the drawing. You've got several lines that are solid with SD and then another solid line. What does the SD stand for? Oh, uh, I. You must have better eyes than me because I'm. There's, there's one on the north side of the, the street as well as one right along the curb line on the south. Running by Fire Station Eight, and then it continues on to the bridge structure to the west and goes over to Academy on the east. See it. Oh, I see. Uh, oh, see. Uh, well, that's storm drain. Storm sewer, storm water. Yes, I have, yes, because they're uh, they're connected on Auburn Street. There's a couple of inlets, so there's yeah. So that's storm drain. All right, and this. And the there is fiber optic bank. that we are working with. We, we know the county has a line uh, on the north side of the bridge, and we, we're coordinating with them to put some new conduits so they can, uh, you know, get put it in uh, out of the way. And we're also working with any other utilities that have any telecoms that have lines out here. And the long dashes with two short in between represent what the easement? That uh, looks like the, yeah, the right of way. Right of way. So, sorry, wrong term. All righty, thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Chair, I did have a question. Go ahead, Carlos. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the, the financials. So you want to fund a uh, city account, the city fund, uh, by writing a check from a PPRTA account uh, to a city <clears throat> account. It, it, is there precedence for that? Uh, with the uh, city of Colorado Springs to do something like that as far as, you know, just funding another account that's uh, outside of PPRTA? Uh, yes, and I'll let Bev uh, explain more, but I know we have uh, billed RTA for expenses, you know, on project expenses where they, they've cut us a check and we've cut them a check also. So, Bev, you want to? Yes, yeah, explain? there is precedent for this and um, especially with utilities work. And this is above and beyond just cost share where we see an invoice. This is writing a funding another account within the city. Uh, I know we've seen cost share where we see an invoice. Um, my concern, I guess, uh, just, uh, just, and again, this is a concern. I think we'll do it right here, but will it pass an audit? Because an auditor will, may, will not see an invoice here. Or, or, or a contract. Right, right. Um, what the auditor will them. see is the board approving this. And then that's the backup to pay it. But right now we have on this project some other contracts that have multiple funding sources. Oh, the city, the utilities, then they each, some is maintenance money, some is capital money. And we're all writing all these checks for, you know, uh, it just is a lot for each but, payment but we pay. to break but it we down pay. into these. But we pay the contractor directly. We don't. Uh, oh, but we've we're... we've done this before, Carlos. We've done this before. It's okay. this especially for utilities. Didn't we do it on West Colorado? Okay. Well, well as long as we have the financial controls in place to uh, uh, to monitor, it looks like we do. We did a lot with utilities. Yeah, it's it doesn't happen price, every price. day, but it happens often. And I understand that we don't want to introduce more bureaucracy because that just drives up the cost of the project and reporting and it's more cost to the taxpayer to have more oversight like this. Sometimes we just uh, doing this will save us money in the long run. 
but I just wanted yeah. to ensure that this was uh, on the up and up. That's really it. All right. Well, and you. really what Mike's presenting today, this is your chance to ask the questions, you know, as far as specifically what work is being done, which you are doing. And that that's part of the process for getting this approved. And the CAC does a very good job at that. And then um, all the, the records are in the minutes and, and, the, uh, and the memos for the auditors. And Carlos, this is part of, this is actually a cost share and it's documented as part of the cost sharing uh, work. We're in, but instead of splitting it between two accounts, you're just moving it into one so the billing is simplified and it's all in one area. Yes. Okay. That, answer, that answer your question, Carlos? Oh, oh yes, it does. It, it's just that once we write the check, we no longer have any, we won't see a contract. It'll go through the city. Right. Okay, Mike. And the last item we have is an informational item. We're uh, adding some CSU funds to the uh, Wildcats uh, construction contract uh, for Sierra uh, Vermaho work. And uh, since it doesn't need board approval, we just have it on uh, as an informational item. That's okay. kind of what we've been doing on this project, but it's not RTA funds. Okay. Any further questions from Mike uh, or the city on the city's request for these contracts? Eight. Se seven contracts and an informational item. <clears throat> um, hearing none, uh, do I have a motion to approve the city's request for these contracts? Hoover, yes. This is Joan. Go ahead, Joan. Um, I'll make the motion to approve the contracts okay. as presented. I have a second. This is Larry. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Um, Jim, before you do that, could I ask you for clarification? Go ahead. There is the, for a recommendation on an information item, do you separate that when you explain to the board that it was information only? Yes. Okay, I'm just, all right. Okay, so we have a motion and a second um, for the city's uh, contracts. Uh, any, no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we'll go to the next item. Thank you. Uh, El Paso County Maintenance and Contracts. Is that John B. Jennifer today? Hi, everybody. Jennifer Irvin, El Paso County, County Engineer. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, um, um, committee. We have one item for your consideration today. Um, we have a maintenance project and it's centered in one specific area of the county in the area of Falcon. And uh, this project includes concrete uh, maintenance repairs and also asphalt repairs. Um, typically we do um, these maintenance under our overall paving contracts, um, but this area needed a lot of maintenance and so because it needed both specifically concrete and um, asphalt maintenance with a lot of patching, we felt like we would get a better price um, if we put all this work into one separate contract. Most of our paving contract, our 2020 annual paving contract just includes overlays. And so, you know, with that contract, um, the, the patching includes uh, is usually a higher price. So I think we got a better price for the overall project. And so what we're asking for is approval for um, a maintenance contract in this specific area of Falcon for approximately $2.5 million. Uh, Jim, I got a quick question for um, on this. Go ahead, Brian. Um, wanted to ask Jennifer real quick the uh, my understanding and I could be wrong you know, there's still construction going on in this area is that correct um, so the the aerial you'll see is um, is a, a little bit older from our, our our aerials in the county so you do see some construction on the south side 
Um, this development has, uh, on the south side, the third filing has not moved forward. Uh, the person who um, was doing the third filing, and um, th this has been, um, you can see it in the map, but has been in that situation since about 2004. So the, the developer who was doing this third filing and, and never finished his subdivision, he passed away. And so that's still in, um, in Limbo. Um, going through whatever process they're going through. But, but we've had these roads, uh, I want to say, since about 2004, uh, okay. 2003, 2004, and, and, and we need to do some maintenance on these roads. They are county-owned and maintained roadways. I got you. Okay, so they, um, uh, the development ran into the, in, into the issues, and, and this is post-delivery post to the county. So, okay, got it. Yeah, so the, the, the area to the south that you see kind of graded, that's, that's still in that same configuration. And, and I believe at some point, um, you know, it will go through whatever it needs to go through um, uh, with that developer and his family. And, and we'll probably see development in that area at a later date. Gotcha, thanks so much. Jennifer, this is Tom. Yes, sir. Um, what is the period of performance in this? Is this to be finished yet this year or in the next summer or what's the program? Um, we still are looking to have this finished this year. If we get underway here, um, still in October, we feel like, I mean, sorry, September, we um, have a, the work should be able to be completed before the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. This is Rick. Uh, yeah, I, I've been in there and that's brutal. Uh, I hope you get it done this year. That, uh, that that's a thunder, roll or thunder road is, that's awful. And so I would definitely motion, make a motion to approve. Mr. Chair, I had a couple of questions too, when there's an opportunity. All right, go ahead, Carlos. Uh, yeah, um, Jennifer, you had said that these, these roadways that you're um, doing some maintenance on, it was what, 2004? Is that correct? Did I hear correct. it correctly? Uh, and so these, uh, this is what, 16 years old? This, uh, this, uh, these roads that you're doing, performing maintenance on? Yeah, and some of them were a little bit earlier than that. This development has gone through phases, so yeah. About average. It, so, so how long uh, for a road uh, for these kind of residential streets? Uh, what's normal and customary for the lifespan before we do any maintenance uh, of this magnitude? I mean, um, we just heard a comment that it's actually in pretty bad shape. So yeah, I'm just so. Curious. So usually um, when we ask for design pavement lives, it's usually about 20 years. Um, and so, um, but what we also know is that, you know, uh, the, the criteria that we had during that time was different than we have today. And I think that, um, you know, we'll, we'll have these across the county um, and probably in other locations because what we were doing at that time, and, and I've talked about this a little bit before, is full depth right. asphalt. And so we, we no longer do that. Um, and so um, at this point, um, uh, we do a, a composite section, which includes a, a sub base, an engineered sub base and um, you know, the asphalt. So uh, we feel like that holds up better. So today's using today's standards, these are substandard residential streets. Is is that correct? Is that a, a correct characterization? These are substandard compared to today's standards. Correct. Okay. Well, and and Jennifer, I remember if I remember correctly too, there's some uh, some serious soils challenges in that area. Yeah, there's there's high groundwater, and then um, I I I. Uh, uh, there's some some issues with some compaction over some of the utilities, and we there's been some um, issues out there. Um, if you go out there, and and I think um, one of the members said it very correctly, um, we are having people. Th there's potholes that are very large, and so what we're having out there is people are swerving um, into oncoming traffic, and so this at this point, um, the pavement is not in uh, terrible condition everywhere. And so we're going back and we're doing select locations. Um, and, and some of those are just because of high groundwater. And so, but we are um, working to make this uh, safe local roadways. Are we still building? Are we still building in places? Are we doing any remediation for this high groundwater? 
In other words, if we built this again today, would we encounter the same kind of problems 15, 16 um, years down, down later? Um, would the same thing happen again? That's my question. No, uh, so the repairs that we are, we are doing are, are gonna be different than, than what is out there today. So in other words, ground, ground soils, uh, remediation of, uh, of drainage and so forth, we would not expect that to be going forward today or in the future, correct? Is that a correct characterization? I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I'm just trying to understand, is this an that's issue correct. that our county commissioners need to understand that we're putting substandard stuff out there that's costing, what do we say, $2.5 million? That's taking a pretty big chunk out of your budget. You probably already know that. I'm just saying <laughs> something that's probably obvious, but. Uh, I just want to yeah, understand it is. And, where, and where we are with our standards. One of the things that we've been doing, if you notice, most of our, uh, because we do have a, a limited amount of funds, most of our funding goes towards, <laughs> um, if you look at our, our project list that when we do asphalt repair, most of our uh, funding goes towards our collectors and our, <laughs> our wheels. And so this is uh, a, a little bit different than what we usually do. But, but at this point, um, and I think the, the um, I can't remember who said it's a, it. It's a tol it's intolerable situation. And yeah. we've got to go in there, I think. It's uh, a right safety there. issue. And so that's why we're going to go ahead and do it. But, but, you know, as I said, typically we just roll this into our overall, um, you know, long line paving program, you know, in our, our concrete. But we thought we'd get a better, and we, we believe we did, uh, a better cost for this by, you know, concentrating one contractor in here to do the specific work that we need to do. But, but I, um, th the repairs that we're doing are not just going to be uh, uh, replacing what's out there today. We are going to go ahead and um, um, saw cut. We're going to um, dig those areas out and, and, and that's why it takes a little bit more work. There's more labor intensive. And, and then we're going to go ahead and put back in the appropriate um, uh, things in those areas where those roadways are failing. And, and, and then one more question. Happy. Yeah, one more question. Uh, how many miles, lane miles, is this project? Um, it, I'd have to look back and I can give you numbers. Um, because we are doing spot locations, it's not specifically lane miles. So we're doing- How many, spot. in purple, how many, about their purple, if I was to add up all the purple end to end, 10 miles, 20 miles? I, miles? I could get back with you on a number. It's probably two or three. Two or three? Mm -hmm. 2.5 for, boy, you know, with the 2C, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, a lane mile is about a quarter of a million dollars per lane mile. This is an expensive maintenance project compared to 2C. I, I'm just, you know, I, I mean, I'll go ahead and approve it, but I'm just concerned that you're spending oh, a lot I can of come back with additional information, but it's it's not just pavement. Yeah. We're taking out curb and gutter here, and um, it, it's not just doing pavement. Well, let's say it's five and miles. I, I, you're two again, times, you're twice, you're twice two. I don't have yeah. an exact number for the distances, but what I can provide you yeah. is all the square feet of the repairs and all that information. Yeah, let's say it's five. Then you're looking at... Uh, was it 2.5 million? So it's five miles. That's half a million dollars per mile. I'm just looking at miles. You're double what the city of Colorado Springs 2C is. And that's a complete overlay. So I'm just, you know, compared to that, it's like, why don't you just do a complete overlay in curb and gutter like we're doing for 2C and, and uh, get it at half cost. I'll go ahead. I'm not going to argue with here, but I'm just a little concerned that, you know, there's a lot of money and I know you're very limited on budget. Um, these expensive, projects uh, just just give me just give me concern with that I'll, I'll turn it over back to the chair thank you you're muted Jim uh, if, if nobody else is going to do it I'm going to make a motion any other questions for Jennifer I want to make a motion to approve all right hearing none thank you Jennifer uh, do I have a motion to approve the county's request I just made the motion to approve. Gene, this, second, is, this is Larry. I approve, uh, second that motion. Okay, so it was uh, Rick, Rick Hoover and, and uh, Larry? Yes. Okay. Correct. Uh, do I have a motion? I mean, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? 
Hearing none, uh, the county's request is approved as, as presented. Okay, item number seven, City Colorado Springs Transit Services, monthly report. Good afternoon, Brian Vitulli with the City of Colorado Springs Mountain Metropolitan Transit uh, with their monthly transit report. So we're reporting on uh, July of 2020, uh, ridership for the month of July. For our fixed route, for our fixed route services, we provided a uh, little over 150,000 trips. You could see that in July of 2019, we provided around 305,000 trips. So we're, we're still down quite a bit. Um, it's like a 50% decrease from this July to July of 2019. Um, also adding to that, um, you know, Route 33, which is the Manitou shuttle uh, that travels to the incline and the Cog Railroad, that is one of our heaviest ridership routes, especially in the summertime. Um, but in July of 2019, that, that route uh, provided, you know, almost 14% of our total ridership. So not having Route 33 in service uh, for this time period is, is making the hit on our ridership even a little bit harder. But uh, the good news is that that, that route resumes service on August 24th. So that's, uh, that's good news. For our ADA paratransit service, um, we provided about 4,200 trips in July. And that's uh, still a decrease of uh, a little over 65% from July of 2019. For our specialized paratransit taxi choice option, um, this, this service is still suspended. Um, so we're not seeing any ridership on this. Um, a, a little bit of the backstory for our taxi choice option. You know, this is a option for customers um, who are uh, using our ADA paratransit service for, for trips under seven miles. Um, you know, before the pandemic started, we were, we were already having some quality of service issues with the taxi contractor. So ridership was really, really uh, close, close to nothing to begin with. And then when the pandemic hit, um, you know, the, 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 the taxi provider is a subcontractor to our paratransit contractor. And so when the pandemic hit and ridership was reducing on our fixed route service and on our paratransit service, um, our paratransit contractor was faced with uh, laying off some of their operators, furloughing them. And so what went into the decision to um, suspend the taxi choice option was to try to keep some of those operators employed, um, trying to give the passengers who use the service, um, you know, ways to social distance. So in some cases we were, you know, only having one or two uh, passengers on those buses because they are much, much smaller vehicles. So it was also a way to, uh, you know, to keep the, the contractors, the paratransit contractors employees uh, employed. So, but we're starting to see an, an uptick uh, as we are with fixed route ridership um, uh, on, on the paratransit ridership as well. Uh, for our van pool services, um, we operated nine vans in July. Um, there were about 700 and 30 uh, one-way trips reported, and that's a, a decrease of about 80% over July of 2019. Going to project updates, um, the North Nevada Avenue Transit Connectivity Study. You know, we're, we're still uh, we're still reviewing some information. We hope to um, pick this back up with another round of stakeholder meetings. Um, either later this month or in October, um, and then have one final public meeting, um, most likely a virtual public meeting. And so we're, we're hoping to wrap this project up in, in probably October now. Um, for our fall 2020 service changes, um, this is much of the same that I reported on last month. Uh, the Route 40 routing and service adjustments were approved. 
um, through our public process, but due to PPCC um, not holding in uh, in-person classes for the fall, both PPCC administration and Mountain Metro agreed to, to uh, you know, delay the implementation of this until hopefully in the spring, the spring semester. Now we'll, we'll resume conversations with PPCC in December um, and see, see what it's looking like for the start of their spring semester. And then we'll, we'll implement whenever that service resumes. Uh, the other service changes, um, Route 6, which was actually an approved service change from several years ago, but was delayed until the pedestrian facilities were built on Fillmore Street. Well, that's going to go into effect on uh, Monday, September 28th. So Route 6 will be operating on, on Fillmore Street in the area between um, El Paso and Hancock. And then uh, of course the, the Route 36 is the other Manitou Avenue shuttle, which is just a seasonal service that um, out of service for the season on September 27th. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions for Brian? <clears throat> thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you. Um, 7B, um, the City of Colorado Springs monthly change order and property acquisition report. It's an informational item. Does anyone have any questions from their review of that um, agenda item? Not hearing anyone speak up. Um, we'll go on to 7C, quarterly reports from member governments. Uh, Rick? These are the quarterly reports of the uh, <coughs> construction projects that have been completed in uh, or progress uh, within the quarter. Uh, in this case, the second calendar quarter of 2020. Um, I'll be glad to entertain any questions you might have. This is what I use to then uh, go out and uh, do my uh, quarterly field review confirmation. Uh, I call it inspection, but it's just drive-by confirmation. Be glad to take any questions. Any questions? Yeah, uh, yeah this is Mike Chavis. Uh, if there's not any questions from the CAC board, uh, I'd like to introduce Gail Sturdivant. She's the new Public Works Deputy Director, and we have actually revamped the quarter report. So she's going to have a short uh, presentation, just a few slides, kind of talk about the new format. And then if there's any questions uh, on the our report, uh, we'll welcome those because we do have quite a bit of new information and a lot of more financial uh, projections. So okay. with that, I'll let Gail uh, take it away. Okay, great. Uh, Jessica, I assume I can share my screen now, it looks like. Let me get Yep, this. it should let you. All right. And I believe you guys should all be seeing a slide that says introduce, inter, introduce PPRTA 2020 Q2 report. Is that correct? Nothing yet. I don't mm. There it is. Okay, sorry. I think I need to do a second click. Sorry. All right. Um, uh, one more. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Gail Stern. I joined the city of Colorado Springs in April um, as the new city engineer, deputy public works director. And one of the initial tasks that I was given when I started is to look at our quarterly report format and see if we could update it. So this is just going to short presentation just to provide some of those highlights, as Mike mentioned. Uh, this new format is really intended to clarify and augment um, information that was previously provided. It's broken into uh, three main areas. One that's an executive summary that shows an overview of completeness, budget, and schedule, followed by uh, highlights on capital projects and programs, and then um, the maintenance programs. Uh, the completeness today, let me Okay, the completeness today, as mentioned, the, the executive summary discusses completeness of the uh, A-list capital projects. Of uh, the 34 projects, 10 are currently complete, as shown on the pie chart. Uh, you can also see the number and the percentage of the projects complete there on the left side, that those are in construction, engineering, and future phases. 
There's also a schedule ring that goes along the outside of that pie chart that shows the current 10 year PPRTA authorization period. And I'll revisit this graphic later, but this is really a graphical representation of where we are today. I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, the budget outlook and and although the budget outlook um, is described in the report, I want to walk through the outlook table that's provided on page eight of the report just to make sure it's clear what we're trying to communicate to the committee. Uh, the items shown with the green leaders on the slide are information that was previously provided. They show the capital plan and the previous project cost, the original allocation or the cost system that was used at the time of the budget initiative, and the change, either increase or decrease, between the ballot initiative and the cost estimates prior to this quarter. Uh, the city has recently completed a total cost estimating review in all ongoing and future ALS projects. Uh, the information is highlighted in the red text or uh, with the arrow pointing down there called the revised total project cost. As highlighted in the red is the to next to it is the total change in the original allocation uh, with the budget initiative and the updated total project costs. And then finally, we're showing uh, the anticipated additional allocation needed uh, to complete the projects. At the bottom of that same table, you can see both the conservative and optimistic revenue projection. Uh, the conservative revenue projections are based on the 2020 budget with a 3% growth increase per year for 2021 through 2024. The optimistic revenue projection starts um, with a 2021 revenue at a 15% increase above the 2020 budget and then increases 3% for growth in 22, 23, and 24. And that initial 15% increase was supported by the current uh, revenue trends that we heard from Ber uh, Beverly. You know, if you looked at the bottom line of her chart earlier, uh, right now we're 15% over uh, the anticipated budget um, through the first half of the year. Um, as you can see circled in the red, um, the conservative uh, projections result in a $5 million shortfall and the optimistic projection results in an $11.5 in contingency or B-list funding. These two methodologies result in a range of $16.5 million. Uh, revenue projections along with project costs will be continually monitored and modified um, as appropriate. Uh, so what do we do with this information moving ahead? Ultimately, the updated project estimates are used to sequence prog projects to maximize delivery of the program. You'll see schedule adjustments to advance projects earlier to a higher uh, level of design and cost certainty. One of the reasons why Mike brought those four line item transfers earlier. And you'll also see the construction still being uh, scheduled to begin when funding is available later in the program. Uh, this tool will also identify uh, funding towards the end of the program and allows us time for planning and prioritizing things within the program. With the conservative revenue projections identifying um, a potential shortfall, uh, we need to continue our diligence to fulfill the PPRTA commitments to the voters. So there are implementation measures to meet this commitment um, as discussed in the report. And so we uh, have the potential ability to get more competitive pricing for our construction contractors and engineering consultants. Uh, we're gonna to continue to look for opportunities to leverage RTA funding to capture additional uh, grant funding. And worst case, uh, we can per, uh, propose reductions to capital pro programs in future years if needed to deliver uh, the A-list projects. Uh, Although this slide is not, or the data shown on the slide is not shown on the report, I thought it was a good representation of how projects are going to be completed uh, by year with that similar pie chart that I showed earlier within the timeline. Uh, remember, in this case, the blue represents uh, completed projects, green are projects under construction, and red is projects still in engineering. So the top left chart represents the plan status of the, our project, the 34 projects at the end of 2021. Top right is status at the end of 22. Bottom left status at the end of 23. And the bottom right um, at the end of 2024. Uh, all the projects will be initiated by the end of 2021. 
Um, and by the end of the current authorization, 30 of the 34 projects, uh, again, which are shown in blue, should be complete and the remaining four shown in green should be under construction. Uh, the next part of the uh, report has highlights for the A-list capital projects um, and a schedule uh, narrative, which includes um, the project specific budget, a schedule narrative, um, and gives you some highlights of what's going on with the projects. Uh, they all uh, have this visual representation where they are within the project life cycle. Uh, following that, each of the A-list capital programs is described and, and the program spin and completeness is detailed. Uh, the spend history from the past three years is presented along with the spend through the second quarter of 2020. And then each program highlights completed or planned activities uh, for Q2 and then what's coming up in the, in the short term. Similarly, with the maintenance program, um, they are described in the program spin and completeness is detailed. And likewise, there's uh, highlights for the completed and planned activities. Um, as I mentioned, my presentation in short, it was intended to provide a high level overview of the new format. Uh, there is a lot more content in the report, and I, but I'd like to thank you for your time now, and I'm happy to answer questions if you've had a chance to go through it. Uh, if not, I've provided my contact information here, and so you're welcome to reach out to me by email or phone um, to ask some additional questions, or you can send them through uh, Rick's office as well. So with that, Jessica, I'll turn the control back over to you unless somebody wants to see one of the slides. Any questions for Gail? Quick, uh, quickly, would it be possible for us to Gail, have thank a... you um, for the information. Hello, anybody there? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, wanted to find out if we could get a copy of the uh, presentation emailed to us. Uh, yes, Rick, I believe you already have a PDF of the presentation. Is that correct? I'm sorry, please uh, repeat the question. My question to you is, I believe you already have a PDF of the presentation and one of the committee members just asked if they could get a copy of it. Sure, certainly. <clears throat> Any other questions for Gail? Um, Gail, thank you for um, your time and, um, and an update on this report. I, I think the uh, new format <clears throat> um, is informative uh, and will <clears throat> give us a little more, um, uh, a little more insight into the status of the projects and where things are going uh, in each of the areas. And, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that it will also include um, the program areas, not just the A-listed projects, the, the specific construction projects, but some of the program funds as well in terms of the status of where those are going uh, as well. And there is a section, each program, both the A-list and the maintenance program has their own section in the report. Okay. And so I think that should answer what you're looking for. Um, Yes. With a description of uh, what is the intent for that program, and then it shows again that history for the spend for the past three years and then the spend um, for the first two quarters of the year. And at the bottom, it shows highlight what was actually completed and what's uh, in progress or anticipated to be completed in the near term. Okay. So we'll see what you're looking for there. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Gail? I have a comment. Um, Mike, uh, your team has upped their game considerably over the last year and a half. It's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that, um, Tom. I, I was thinking along the same way. We're we're moving in a direction that um, <clears throat> we're moving in a direction that gives us, uh, as representatives of the public, the transparency into the programs that that we need, and um, in order to. Um, do our job, and, and um, I, I echo Tom's comments. Gr great job. I actually, uh, I, I agree very much, and I, I, it sounds funny, but I found the little graphic uh, representation with each uh, project uh, showing where it is in progress um, actually to be kind of very helpful um, 
I don't know if that speaks to my more visual nature of, of understanding or <laughs> or what, but I, li I, I like the new format my, very much. Gail's PMP background is showing up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, everyone learns and takes data in different, uh, different modes. And so that's one of the reasons why we added the, the visualization as much as possible. So you trying to show where the projects are and where they are in their life cycle, I think makes a big difference. Um, and then you can see the words too in more detail as well. It all depends how, how you wanna see the information. Yeah, it's, it's laid out very nicely. It makes it really, uh, really easy to digest. Thank you, Brian. Any other questions for Gail? Great, thank you and welcome to the committee and you're welcome anytime. All right, thanks, Jim. Yeah, as long as you leave Mike at home. No, no, no. <laughs> Oh, Mike along. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, item number 8A, uh, administrative actions. Um, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Is that good? Yes. In, in many administrative actions. Rick, you got anything for that? The memos in the packet. Uh, I can take any questions you might have. Okay. Um, all right. So we're, we're to PPRTA3. Um, so let me kind of just recap just a tad bit and, and kind of what you see in your report. And I, and I, in the interest of time, I, I'm not going to try to go over every conversation and every action that we had, but I, I think I left you guys last time with, um, we would, we would take the comments. We summarized the comments from our last CAC meeting. We presented those to the board. And then um, you should have a copy. And those comments from the CAC meeting are in red in the report. And, and then Rick and I um, got together after the board meeting and to, in order to keep a consolidated record of the back and forth uh, between us and the board, um, we included the board's comments about our comments in blue uh, on that sheet. And so you can kind of see what, how the board reacted to what we presented to them. So um, I think, uh, so just to kind of, that, that's gonna be the format. So we'll continue to add comments and we'll have them in one document. Maybe we'll put a date out to the side or something so we can keep track of what month, what, hap what happened in what month. Um, Rick's already got a date in there. Um, so again, the board in summary, uh, and Reb jump in here if, if I'm, and Rick as well. Um, they're, they're opening the book uh, on the current structure and policies of the RTA um, uh, that we've been in been in existence 20 years now or will be by the time this comes about and as with any good good policy or, or good uh, project you want to kind of review and, and make sure if things change are there reasons for changes maybe the answer is no but in some cases there might be um, and so the board is, is taking this opportunity to involve us, but also to say, look, let's take a look at everything. Um, let's, let's take a look to think outside the box, uh, include some flexibility in our processes and our things. And an example of that be, would be, for instance, on item number uh, two, where we had the A and the B list, we got in discussions about municipalities putting together their list and this, that, and another. Right now, if a, if a member government wanted to join, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, but um, if they join um, in the middle of a voter approved 10 year segment, um, they don't get capital money until it's renewed. Is that correct, Rick? Correct, per the current IGA. Per the current IGA. And so, the board is saying, so what if we included wording in the ballot that would allow a new member to join with approval 
and then their list, their projects, they present their projects would then be added to the A and B list and it would be out of cycle, so to speak. That's currently not possible under the current IGAs. And so, <clears throat> um, uh, so that's the kind of thing is, is that they're looking for is, is new ideas and things like that. Um, so the A and B list issue is, I don't think is, um, is over. Um, they're talking about, for instance, a regional pot where CDOT is not going, uh, doesn't have any intent to fund any, uh, anything. So like, for instance, um, the powers quarter, they're not, they just don't have the funding. And so maybe we have a regional program where we could contribute to um, Highway 24 West uh, up the Ute Pass or maybe uh, 96 out to Schriever or someplace like that that's a regional, that has a regional impact. But if we wait on the state, it would never get done and we would have something to contribute or potentially use as matching funds for grants. Um, so, um, uh, that was, that was part of one of, uh, one of the council, one of the board's, uh, comments. Um, yeah. Uh, I would assume under that scenario, then all of the tax money that we send to Denver for roads down here would no longer be sent to Denver since we bingo. Yeah, bingo. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, having been on the, in PPACG, that whole percentage, uh, of what we're supposed to get and what we get is, is an ongoing discussion with CDOT. Um, but I don't, I, I think that the board in reality is that's not going to change. So I, I don't have an answer to that question, Tom. Well, Jim, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, can I just make a comment yeah, yeah. on that? Maybe there should be, and this goes back to how we word the ballot language, but maybe there's an equity clause that's in there so that we don't encounter, the Pikes Peak region doesn't encounter this cost shifting. Sh uh, shifting. So in other words, if the state doesn't fund um, region two, which is our CDOT region or Pikes Peak area equitably, they don't get the money. So in other words, cost uh, for the cost, uh, like a matching fund, it, it only is available if and only if the state was funding all the projects across the state equitably, including the Pikes Peak region, so, something like that. I, and it's a little, a lot of words there, but I think we can succinctly put something like that in a ballot measure if that's something the board is interested in doing. But I have to agree with Tom and some other people who've chimed in. Uh, we have to be very careful about this uh, money going to, you know, I-70 and nothing coming back. That that would be that would not be fair or equitable. Yeah, and I think that the intent and the discussion was was more of a regional thing that's that's here that impacts us here in the RTA area, um, such as Highway 24, for instance, up Ute Pass. You know. Um, there's a section before it gets to Woodland Park, but <clears throat> uh, improvements on that road impact people in Colorado Springs and Colorado Springs residents transiting that area. And there's currently no mechanism for us to contribute to that. Maybe we want it done sooner than 2035. And um, we having a pot of money to contribute, getting it done uh, kind of like on I-25 and GAP, um, that may influence the decisions of CDOT. That was kind of the, the text, uh, the Can context. I see the beginnings here of the state of SoCo. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so um, the, other, the other measure, and, and so the AB list, the other one was, was, again, I asked the question about, I, you know, some people commented um, about shorten the A list and make the B list. Well, what does that do? And what's wrong with the current A, B list? Maybe we could have one list. So you can see the comments that we had. And, and um, I, I, don't, I don't recall that there was a definitive answer on A, B list other than it, we've not done with that discussion. Um, I think, would, Rick, would you say that's a fair, uh, I think with A, the content or the makeup of the A, B list and that's what is going to be ongoing. I agree. Uh, I think the first question on the A and B list is, does the CAC uh, or do the CAC and board 
want the member governments to have a priority group of projects? If the answer is yes, then that's the A group. If if the if, if the CAC and board don't want to show the public a, a priority A group, then it would just be one list. So I, I think that's the first question to have the CAC vote on is, do you want a priority capital project list? Yes or no? And, and implying there that the A list is a higher priority than the B list. Yes. <clears throat> so what, what is the, what are the members of the CAC uh, feel like, uh, do we feel like we ought to have an A and a B list or just a single list? Uh, so what Jim, are you guys, what are you guys thoughts on that? Jim, I'd like to make a comment. I, I think it's, it's good to have an A and B list. I, I think the problem with the A and B list is that we've uh, kind of gotten into this idea that every single A-list project for every single member government has to be done before anyone goes to the B-list. And I, that doesn't seem like the way we should be doing it. Cause if, uh, you know, if Green Mountain Falls gets their A-list done and they have money still, they should be able to go to their B-list without having to sit and wait on everybody else to get there. I think that's a very important Lucy. distinction and, but it is, it's a separate issue for a separate vote. Uh, the first vote is, do you want an A priority uh, grouping? Well, I, I think A and B list is, is a good, still a good idea. What's priority, what's not. But. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on that? Yeah, this is Joan. Go ahead, Joan. Um, I concur with Tony on having the A and B list. I think it's necessary. I'll yeah, the question on that on the table is yes, I think we ought to have a priority list. Isn't that the question, Rick? Yes. Yes, I, I, vote, I vote that we have a priority list. Okay. Um, Gene? I agree with most of what, if not everything that Tony said. Um, I believe we really do need an A and B list because it does prioritize those items uh, based on the member government's view of what's important and what's less important. But I also agree that it makes no sense to tie the hands of the county or any other member government to wait on everyone else in the RTA to move on to B-level projects if they've completed theirs. They, they, their money doesn't get diverted back into the RTA to another government. They need to be able to spend it during that 10 year time period on their projects. So the restriction that all A-list projects for all member governments needs to be modified. Jim, I don't this know is that it's been a major issue so far, but eventually that's going to raise its head and it's going to be a real ugly issue to deal with because as i said it's not fair to the other member governments to, to have their money tied up and not be able to spend it waiting on the let's say el paso county or the city of colorado springs to finish their a list since they're the two biggest pots of money in the rta right now jim yeah um the, the thing we have to keep in mind is that the money distribution is based on population, but the roads are not. The roads, <coughs> the, the status of the maintenance for the roads is not based on population. So it should be each individual entity's own A and B list that they then trip over to the B list when they finish their A's. Uh, Jim? Yes. Um, this is Cheryl, and I go back to, you know what, are we truly a regional or is that PPACG's role in being regional? So if we are not, if we're trying to replace PPACG in the transportation planning on a regional basis, then we need to look at the A and B list as a sep separate in for each entity. And, and again, at this, the second point I wanted to make is that the reason that I think that the PPRTA passed was that they were able to give we were able to give the voters 
the exact what we were going to do with the money we were use, you know we were taxing people on and these were the projects we were going to do and so if you were in green mountain falls and you had a project you were voting for that project to be done so that and this goes back to what gene was saying that you need to separate and say okay green mountain falls you've earned this money or you've collected this money through pprta and therefore you get to use it on your projects in El Paso County. This is, this is the money that you've collected and gotten through with this percentage and you can get those projects done. But I still think you need to have the A and B list because voters are voting for those projects to be done. Yeah, it's signifying a priority. Yes, um, thank you, I'm done. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, Chair. one thing could, uh, this is Ann in Green Mountain Falls. Hi, Ann. Um, you know, there, there is a misunderstanding about what the name means. It's the Pikes Peak Rural Transportation Authority, not regional. And um, see, I'm up in Green Mountain Falls and Reb represents Green Mountain Falls too. And of course, Highway 24 is a very major highway east-west in our country even. <laughs> I mean, well, from out of Colorado. And, um, so, see, to me, it never made sense that the little improvements that have been done up in uh, Green Mountain Falls, I've mentioned this before, that stop at um, Cascade and Chapita Park, um, the Pikes Peak Rural Can Transportation Authority actually goes to the edge of El Paso County. And that improvement wasn't that far. So, I've always thought that Woodland Park, especially Woodland Park, because they have a government, they have a taxing authority just like Green Mountain Falls does. Chapita and Cascade do not. And um, that's just a little glitch, you know, as far as getting a road really done, especially on a highway. <laughs> that's, I, don't, I don't understand all the ins and outs, but I know that some of that work that was done right about Cascade where the road would cut off to go up Pikes Peak, there was private money that was put in there. And that's being done here and there. Um, I'm just kind of talking. I don't know what I'm even saying, except that it's so piecemeal that that is a problem. And I guess everybody knows that. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Hey, Jim, Mr. Chair, I did have a comment okay. and a question, if I'm available. Go ahead, Car go ahead Carlos. Uh, yeah, my comment is that the last discussion, this goes back, there's two questions about the A and B priority. The other one is whether or not a uh, member government's B list items can advance before the other A items list items are funded. Uh, Jennifer Urban made a very compelling case at the last meeting, uh, had bringing this up, and I don't know if Jennifer, you're still on the line, but you did say that what the PPRTA represents is a regional commitment to all the items and that, you know, really the PPRTA is not a pass-through entity for member governments to fund their specific projects. And so the concern was, is that if we had this idea that we decouple funding uh, on a per member basis, that that could disadvantage some of the other uh, entities. Uh, Jennifer and Bruce brought that up and I just wanted to make that comment that there is a contrarian opinion to that idea of let's see if we can move the B list before anybody else does. This is a regional model, uh, regional commitment, and all our members, all the people need to commit to regional solutions. The other, the other does that make sense, uh, Jennifer? I think yeah. I, that was your comments from last month. Um, the other one was uh, a question, and this had to do with the priorities. Um, this is maybe a question for engineering, but how confident are we, are we able to come up with a good cost estimate so that we actually are very confident that if we put together an A list, that we will be able to commit to that. I think cost estimation was a concern and that's about the only thing that kind of gives me pause. If we can't come up with a good cost estimate, I don't see how we're gonna be able to come up with a good A and B list. We should just have A list. But if we can come up with a good way of understanding, yeah, we can do this and we're very confident, we got good cost estimates, uh, we should be able to, to complete this within the 10 year time frame. Okay, so the, the cost estimate I hold that thought. Um, just a, a very quick answer to your comment on that. Here, there is a move afoot by the city to um, 
to initiate a process to uh, improve cost estimation, and your point is taken, is that um, there are two factors in terming to trying to schedule whether we're going to complete something or not. And one of them is uh, cost estimating, as you said. The other one is uh, revenue forecasting in terms of uh, what is the revenue forecast and then how far will you get in any given year based on that revenue forecast. And, and, and Bev works that hard uh, and others do as well. And I think it is, it is important. But if we've got the prioritized list, um, that is the priority, that A list is the priority and we should work on completing those. Um, so um, in, in my opinion. Um, so that's my two cents worth on that. Um, so what I've got is, you know, we've got uh, about six people um, or so that are saying that we should go ahead and go with an A, B list. Jim? Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, I brought up last time, and I want to bring it back up again, that first of all, I, I was with the understanding that we did have an a, B, a and B list for each member. It wasn't one single A, B list. Right. Now that's, so I don't know why we're having a discussion about creating an A, B list for each member. The other thing is I brought up last time is if we have 15 or 20, 20 projects in Colorado Springs or El Paso County that we want to do on the RTA and you name the number of those one through 20. Number one being the highest priority, number 20 being the least priority. Then you pass that to the voter and you follow that. Then if all of a sudden number 12 gets outside funding, that they can use, they have to use now, they can come to the CAC, present the program, and have that priority changed to a higher priority number. Or if, for example, on the uh, Fontenero Bridge, Railroad Bridge, where we had to bring it up from the B list to the A list, and all of the discussion we had about that, that would not be an issue. We'd simply say, okay, the bridge is on a number 12. We can need to do them together. Let's bring it up to number five. And that way they bring it to the CAC. The CAC votes on it, discusses it, and sends it to the board to either make a decision to upgrade that particular project or not to. And that way there isn't an A, B list. There's a priority list for all the projects we want to do in the next 10 years. Thank you. All right. So you're saying no, no A, B by member, just a single one through X uh, prioritized list. No, by member. By member. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Colorado Springs has their list. El Paso County has their list. Rima has their list, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, there's no worry about the B list. It's just one through however many through X. And then the, to change anything on that priority list has to come to the CAC and to the board to get passed. Okay. Jim, this is Rick Sonnenberg. May I speak to that? You may. Uh, I think we need input from city and county staff on that. Previously, um, it's the, the A and B groups have been just the priority group. It, it went on the ballot alphabetically as an A group alphabetically. There, there was no um, one through 75 priority list that was carved in stone. It, it was left to each member entity to <laughs> their, their annual priority in their annual budget. So um, if, if we're going to uh, list one through 75 or one through 150 uh, prioritized, carved in stone in the ballot, uh, and you can't violate that sequence, we need city and county staff input, and I would request that right now. Yeah, this is Mike. Uh, um, I think uh, prioritizing an A-list over a B-list is okay. If you try to prioritize projects specifically, that, I think, depending on how 
the ballot language it structures that priority if it's got to stay that could be problematic as we're trying to plan out the completion of all projects over a 10-year period because normally what we do is we we do two or three larger projects at the beginning middle and end and fill in with smaller projects you know as, as needed but if you've got a priority that you have to do one two and three first um, how do you plan for the other ones? Because, you, you know, does that mean you can't go to number two to do number one? Or, you know, let's let's say you get enough money to do one and two in the first year or two. But, you know, so that, that could be, you know, problematic in scheduling with the cash flow and all that. So I'd, I'd be, I guess we'd have to talk a little bit more about actually prioritizing the sequence of projects. Yeah, and if you go back and look at that, even just the updated budget outlook, and you'll see over the next few months as we start bringing budget input forward that how you've got to sequence and move projects to get them fit in, which is what Mike's saying. So there has to be a combination of priority of need and funding availability. Okay, I could, I could see Jim, how, yeah, I this could. This is Richard Robertson. Yeah, I, I just one second. I, I, I could see where um, particularly as fast as the, the area is growing, um, having to go in a particular priority or go through the administrative process of coming in to change that um, <clears throat> uh, could be a limiting factor, um, especially with a developer decide they're going to do something or uh, stuff. It just means it's, there's an, as Rick pointed out, there's an administrative step to come in and do that but it's just another step in the process. So I, I, could, I, could, I could see both sides of that argument from a, from, a personal, um, uh, from a personal basis. Richard, go ahead, you ask. Uh, yeah, the, <clears throat> I, I think uh, the idea of a numerated list that you have to follow one uh, through uh, just one and then two and three and four uh, on an A list or, or, or a total list is way too restrictive for any, uh, certainly uh, the large uh, communities such as the city and the county. And uh, I don't even think it would go over as well with the voters. The voters, uh, remember that you're, you're just talking about the entire jurisdiction of like the county of El Paso or the city of Colorado Springs. And uh, if a person looks down and says, hey, I don't see anything in my area uh, until who knows when, uh, maybe at the very end of it, there's gonna be less likely support for it. If you have a list that the county and the city and the other jurisdictions can vary within it, I think you're going to get a much stronger vote. And so uh, I, uh, I like the idea of staying with the A and B list idea. And I am absolutely opposed to the concept of trying to put numbers as to, well, we'll finish this one first, then we'll go, have to go the next. And any deviation uh, has to be approved by uh, recommended to the board by the CAC. Uh, it just as it's just way too restrictive. It might even result in a failure to pass. Okay. Thank you. Jim. Yes. This is Larry. Okay. Go ahead, Larry. Um, I sort of in, uh, agree with uh, some of the comments that Richard just made and a couple of the previous comments. I support the A and B list. Um, I don't support a total list because what we've done over the years is with the A list, that is the projected amount of revenue that we hope to have to where we can complete those projects. And if we have more, then we can go to a B list. If we have just one total list, you're going to have people saying, all right, here's my project, you know, three quarters of the way down. How come we haven't gotten to that one yet? So I think the A list, B list differentiation 
um, is more detailed as far as what we're looking at doing, you know, in the next 10 years. Um, I think the way that the projects have been listed alphabetically is much more flexible than trying to list project one through 20. Um, I agree with Richard, that just becomes a little too cumbersome and you can't move around because you have to get approval from the CAC and the board before you can make a change to that. All right, so All right. let me ask this, uh, summarize this real quick here just for a second. So what, what uh, a, a number of you are saying are an A and a B list. Um, there have been uh, a couple of comments that are an A and B list by member versus just an overall A, B list. Um, so how many, are, how many are pushing for an A, B list by member? I think- I like uh, that idea, it's shown by right. member. Okay. And do it alphabetically. Jim, Jim Bray. Yeah, so go ahead, um, Tom. Those lists should be done alphabetically so you don't get trapped into where, hey, you said you were going to do this one first. Yeah, and, and it's, yeah. It's gen, it generally becomes just an A list. But uh, what I'm trying to get a feel for is right now it's not by member. It's an overall A list and a B list. Um, there are, Some people have said they want an A list and a B list by member. So I'm um, trying to differentiate between what we have now and a new suggestion of an A, B list by member. Mr. Jim Jean Bray. Oh, this is Joan. All right, Joan, you, you were talking before I interrupted. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go uh, ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I like the A and B list set up by member governments rather than the way we've done it in the past. It, you know, we divide the money up among the member governments and it should be at their discretion how they spend their money within what's allocated and what's on their list. So by having each entity put together a list I think will be clearer in the minds of the voters um, what's to be accomplished. Okay, who else? Gene, you had, you, you yeah. had your hand up there. I don't see uh, a whole lot of difference between an A and B list by member as opposed to an A and B list that we have now because each one of the projects on the lists that we have now tie directly to a member government. So okay. functionally, there's no difference. Okay. Uh, Mr. Carl, yeah, Carl, I have to agree with uh, Eugene there is that I'm looking at the ballot, reading the ballot, right, looking at the ballot from last time, and it's just an alphabetized list that doesn't specify which member of government. And I say, well, what's the benefit of, of uh, splitting it out by member government? And I think Joan just had a good reason is that it may be a, a selling point for the voters if they see, okay, I live in Manitou Springs. Let me see what projects we're working on here. And so they can zero in for that into that rather than going into a, you know, a detailed list and try to understand mm -hmm. what's there. So I can see that being a benefit, what Joan just brought mm -hmm. up. But other than that, I, it's, I don't see any other value in having a, a member only uh, a list. Okay. Could I say something about Green Mountain Falls? Sure. Uh, sure. I don't understand the A and B because I wasn't on the, on this, you know, when it was voted on. But I do know from experience in Green Mountain Falls, um, they had several projects. We've had emergencies. The PPACG, the county, and so forth have come to our rescue. Plus, we get a certain amount of money from the PPRTA period. And it's based on our population, I believe. And within that, we've been able to transfer funds. For instance, we had a thing called, we need stilling basins, basins to prevent the lake from filling up from the mountain water. 
but we pushed that uh, money over to fix Belvedere Road, which was completely almost destroyed with flooding. So there was flexibility. I don't understand how it works, but whatever way it was working, um, we didn't get a lot of money back. And I don't think Joan does either because it's really based on our population and what we put in, I think, as far as money. But it's been pretty, you know, it's been able to be flexed. Let's put it that way, whatever I'm trying to say. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Who else? Pam, it's yes. right. Okay. I withdraw my suggestion and uh, <laughs> I vote I vote for the uh, priority list A, B by member. Okay. Hey, Jim. Yes. Um, so the way it is now, you've got an A list and a B list not broken out by entity on the ballot and it's passed twice. We still manage it by entity internally but if you, I can see just as many reasons you would turn people off listing it on the ballot by entity as, you know, if some, if I live in Manitou and I see I have one, maybe two projects over the next 10 years compared to the 20 projects that some of the other entities get, I'm going to think I'm getting shortchanged and maybe not vote to support it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Good point. But I still think it could be managed by entity because that's how we're doing it now, regardless of how it's on the ballot. Tim, it's Rick. I'd, may I address that? Yes. Uh, I would suggest that we um, that the ballot be the same format that it's been, uh, an A and a B, um, alphabetized, not have the member entity highlighted, but simply change the wording which says. Uh, the, uh, with priority A project being completely fund, funded prior to, prior to going priority B projects, just change that sentence to allow individual members to go to a B from the A if they completely fund their A list, and then each member can go to a B, but the, the, just revise that sentence in the ballot, but the rest of the format would stay the same. Uh, and, I agree with you. This is Gene Bray. Yeah, I, I think, I, I think that he, and here's my, here's my initial thought on that was that now we get into gaming it and uh, somebody puts five items on their A list and 20 items on their B list. And they can say in a political campaign, well, we got through and we got to the B list. Well, hell, you only had three projects on the A list. So, um, uh, I, there's, there's been some thoughts or comments about shortening the A list so we can get to the B list sooner. I, I don't, I don't understand that logic. And so while I understand Rick's comment, um, I'm, I'm just wondering from a, and it's politicians, but from who's going to, who's going to game the system that way for political gain. And that's what we, I don't want the RTA to be engaged in that, but okay. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to summarize on the AB list. Um, I think that in general, um, what I'm hearing is we like the idea of an AB list. The discussion is either by member or that that is by member uh, or just AB alphabetized managed by member. Um, and the other option was no AB, but just one through X. Um, in, in some kind of priority order with a process described to come in and change that should circumstances arrive. Is, did, I, did I get all of that kind of summarized pretty good into three, those, three, those three areas? Because I want to move on to one more. Oh, wait a minute, uh, Gail, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing to think uh, for you to think about, and, and you can pontificate about this after I mention it, but the one thing that may be helpful for us you know, when we plan the RTA list, we're looking 12 years out. And uh, for us, it may be better to have a slightly shorter A list, really looking to, to construct projects in that five to seven or seven, five to eight year horizon, having some flexibility in those last couple of years, because as we go and, and have the ability to go to the B list, priorities may change from what we think now, you know, 10 years, 12 years down the road. So. 
there is a, an engineering perspective why we might want some flexibility to be able to go and relook at our priorities on projects based on needs and circumstance at the time. So just think about that from our perspective. And that, and that flexibility current exists. It's already happened a couple of times where circumstances have changed and a B list item has been discussed and moved up from the B list to the A list to be done early um, because of circumstances. And, and so that flexibility does exist. The board can make that decision to, to do that. Um, so <clears throat> understand that it's a flexibility issue. Thanks. Okay, I want to I want to move on to one more um, item real quick, um, and I think we can put this to bed. Um, on last month, we talked about what year 2022 24. We had a long discussion about getting um, getting dates right and and where the people can get their list and this that and another. Um, the attorney. Um, uh, was at the board meeting and was part of the discussion. And um, uh, there can be um, uh, uh, concurrent, so they can, a, a city that has the voting power. Um, Rick, you want to explain this better than I do, but the idea, but the board thinks that 2022 is the date and that there's, there's timing uh, the timing allows the city to still get a, a municipality to get their list together and vote at the same time we're voting. Rick, yes. is that right? Yes, I'll take a stab at that. Um, Jennifer Ivey, the attorney, said um, in answering a specific question, uh, yes, the a new prospective member can vote to join in November 2022, the, the date that the uh, PPRTA board seems to be shooting for um, that a prospective member can vote to join uh, and include their capital projects on the same ballot as ours. Um, it might be confusing to uh, both the current PPRTA voters and the prospective PPRTA voters to have two different items um, sequentially on that simultaneous ballot but is, it is legally and procedurally um, correct and legal. Um, she preferred, however, for new prospective member governments to have their votes to join prior to November of 2022. And in all cases, there is time for the prospective members to do that prior to November of 2022. But the board is really pushing to 22 and and some of the discussion we had about uh, not having enough time. Um, and so the, the parallel processes between the bigger RTA issue and a new one can be going in parallel, uh, but could be confusing. But if we did the, uh, had the members that wanna join do their election first, is that going to be a, um, are they, the entities going to have to pay for that election? In other words, is it part of the cycle? It's not. That they would have to pay for their election. Their right. And election. yes, as Rama did when they joined. Right. But then they didn't get any money. Well, um, let's be clear on this. Rama, it was a procedural ish, not Rama, um, the other one, Calhan. No, uh, Rick, help me out. Yeah, yeah it was a c procedural issue that wasn't followed and it had nothing to do with timing. So we have to keep that in mind. And also, if the member governments that want to join, future member governments, if we have it at the same election as ours, the ballot will be much longer, much more complicated, much more expensive, and we might have to have more than one question, depending on how it's structured. The attorney went over some of the options and it is very confusing for the voter. So it's, it's got if then type statements, things like that. 
Right, right. And then if we split it up to make it a little less confusing by having more than one question, this could get very, very expensive. Because mm -hmm. we're charged based on a lot of different factors in an election. And it, it's, it's, it's expensive to begin with. Well, because it, we have such a lengthy ballot question. So just, just let you know that. Okay. Well, I think that the, the board for all kinds of reasons is pushing for a 2022. So unless we've got some kind of compelling reason, um, um, I, I think we don't need to keep hashing through this unless, uh, or hashing over old discussion. The board is, is really pushing forward to 2022 for the, a lot of the reasons that we discussed so that if for some reason there is a problem, uh, the voter turnout is higher and they have a chance to go back in 23 uh, to, to do that. And worst case, they have to do it in 24, uh, but that's really pushing it in case it, uh, it fails or, or whatever, you have to come back in 25. So there's, but there's several, uh, several discussion around that and the board, in my opinion, is, is settled on 22 and I, I don't think anything we're gonna say is changing anything. Well, well, Mr. Mr. Godfrey, can I just clarify that? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 2022, yeah, no, let's, let's, let's shoot for that. I think that's a, a goal. What 2022 will not have and what I hear is that new members do not try to put their ballot measure on 2022. If they want to join, then they need to do it next year or prior and uh, indicate uh, their intention to join the PPRTA through a vote of their population so that when 2022 comes, we know exactly who the member governments are. That I think is the question. 2020, it's not the date so much, but what's gonna be on the ballot. Right. And I have to say that if, if our attorney is recommending a lower risk option here to have the preferable uh, new members come in prior to the 2022 elections, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. If, if that's what she thinks um, based on this. Um, and so I just wanted to relay to you guys that, that I, I, think the, I think that unless we have a, and can come up with a compelling reason, 22 is where the board wants to go. Rick, would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is Ann again. Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, others, we, I, I often tune in on Zoom and listen to what the board members are saying. You know, we can all do that. Um, so that's just another idea for us to actually listen to what board members are saying and not just later hearing about it. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and you correct me if I'm not relaying something properly. Oh no, you do fine, but <laughs> you know how it is. It's very sure. hard. Sure, sure. <laughs> thank you, right. Jim, no, you're no. great. <laughs> no problem. So the the other the other question number four we had about additional members and and stuff. Um, um, there was no there was no preferred new members um, voiced by the board of men. We should go ask these people or shouldn't go ask these people. I think that. Um, there's been some conversation among the board members about who might be some of the entities. Um, as we mentioned, it would have to be a taxing authority like say Woodland Park um, or Fountain or, um, but security wide field are just named communities. They're not a taxing or, and there's a legal term for this that Rick can correct. But um, what I gathered from the board was that <clears throat> they didn't have anything in mind when they asked about board membership. Now, what they did say was that <clears throat> there needs to be a balance between the larger entities and the smaller entities. For instance, if we added another smaller community, um, let's just say, for instance, if they ordered, if they added a new member community like say Calhan, then they would have they would want to add a new member to the board for the city and the county in order to maintain 
the ratio of small entities to large entities so that accumulation of small entities couldn't override the city. Um, and so depending on who they add, if anybody, there would be the appropriate changes to the membership of the board and the membership of the CAC, potentially the CAC, in order to maintain the ratio that exists now so that the city or somebody doesn't get overruled by a bunch of little people. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, there's a little sarcasm there, but that, that was their, um, uh, the discussion at the board about membership on the board and adding new members that if we add someone, um, then we need to look at the ratio of board and CAC. And then there was also some discussion about particularly maybe saying weighting, weight like adding a weighted factor to some of the entities in order to maintain that, um, uh, that ratio or to keep a, uh, a, a larger community um, uh, majority that they have on the board now, the ratio. So, um, <clears throat> uh, but there was not a, we need to invite so-and-so. I think they're going to pick out a couple of people and I think that PPACG is working with them uh, to help put together some kind of potential projects. Uh, Rick, is, is that, did I summarize that okay? Yes, I, I think the, <clears throat> the list of prospects is being developed at the board level and, and I don't think the CAC needs to spend any time on that today. Right. Uh, so the, the board will discuss that next Wednesday and, and then it'll probably come back to the CAC. The, the other issue that you mentioned is the ratio issue. So you, you might want to spend some time as a CAC uh, discussing that. If, if uh, Calhan joins, then what, what does the, uh, what should the members of the uh, number of uh, board directors be for the city of Colorado Springs and El Paso County? If Calhan and Palmer Lake both join or Calhan, Palmer Lake and Woodland Park join, then what should, how many board directors should there be with the city and county? Uh, the, that ratio is something you might want to spend some time on this meeting or next. But, uh, you know, if you had one, two or three or four little guys, then what, what, uh, how many more board directors and or CAC members uh, do the two larger entities get? Jim? Yes, go ahead, Tom. It strikes me that we already have that ratio established by the way the funding is distributed. That's right. Uh, very similar to the way the census is done. The issue by, is the voting. by population. Yeah, but the funding and the membership and the voters, voting members of the board are two different things. Yeah, but I mean, the, the distribution uh, is, like you said, it's two different things, but the distribution of funding is by population. Why can't the entire thing be revamped so that the distribution of representation is also by population? Because then the city of Colorado Springs that has the most retail outlets that all the other member governments people come and shop at will decide everything. 70, a little over 70%. It's, it will be that clear. This was supposed to be a regional government. So they spread it out a little bit so that the smaller member governments, their vote actually counts. In practice, has the city of Colorado Springs ever been told no? Yes. <laughs> yes, they were told no on an issue that was very contentious and it was during the downturn in the economy. They yeah. wanted to use PPRTA funds to pay staff. So we would write the city a check and they would pay staff. And it was very contentious and it was decided the other way. And in the end, I'm not sure they're all that unhappy about it because 
during downturns in the economy, people, you know, uh, need to do something to fix something that's going on that in the long term might, um, might be detrimental to the RTA. Very carefully um, said, that was good. <laughs> two, two more instances, um, the Van Buren situation where the city, uh, Mike Chavez made a presentation to, uh, he wanted to borrow some um, uh, funds out of a name project to move into a program fund to um, improve Van Buren um, for bike lanes and sidewalks for kids walking to three schools. And that was turned down by the board. Um, and a third instance was the, the uh, trucks for maintaining traffic signals. Uh, I think uh, Kathleen Prager requested that, and the board turned that down um, after over the 15 years they had approved uh, 30 vehicles for the city of Colorado Springs. But when it came to uh, some trucks, some vans to be outfitted to maintain traffic signals, the board turned that down. So I, I don't remember the exact vote between city and county, but between Bev's instance and my, my two, there are at least three instances where the city's request was denied. And I'm glad you guys brought that up because that is precisely why the city, I think, is pushing and I, and, and I, it, I, well, I shouldn't say the city, but that's why certain members are pushing for uh, this balance to be maintained because there is a concern that instances like that would increase if smaller member governments who are more rural um, uh, are, are admitted after the fact. So this is an important historical discussion to have. This is Scott. I have a thought about leaving the membership exactly the way it is, but if you get new members that are smaller entities, maybe the smaller entities rotate who is or is not on the board given years. Why? No, that's not fair. In order to maintain, in order to, in order to maintain the ratio, Scott. Yes. Uh, one option. Fair. One option that may be considered by the board is to have a little bit of a weighted voting system, so that every time a smaller member government is added, they don't necessarily have as big of an impact. And the board's gonna discuss that. Well, and the city of Colorado Springs is gonna discuss that at uh, a meeting that they're gonna have. But I, that type of thing could happen that would make make the, you know, some of the larger member governments a little happier, but it, it's just one of those things that it's like everybody should have some say. What about but how much and what, is, what about have maybe a half vote? In other words, instead <laughs> of everybody having a full vote, they have a percentage of a vote to keep yeah. the, the balance the same. That's so, kind of what I was thinking was that <clears throat> Maybe the city, gets, the city gets one and a half or a small entity like Raymond gets three quarters or, or something. Or you use alternate members just like we do now. It, this is Joan. It almost sounds like you're muddying the waters that <laughs> trying to go to half votes and that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't think that that is a, a practical model. Jim? Yes, sir. I have a suggestion. Number one, until they decide they're going to accept new members, what's the point in pointing out what's going to, what the rules be? When I say that, literally, I'd like to go back to three for just a second. Decide you want to have the election in 2022. When I say that, that gives uh, the entities plan for it okay 
And if the board decides, no, we don't want to tie it to 2022 because there was some discussion, well, I don't see any problem waiting until 2024. It doesn't make any difference. It gives them an opportunity. It lets the government, whoever they are, know that that's fixed. The idea of finite or arguing about two, whether it's B, A and B lists, A and B entities included, or just an A to B ballot initiative, not saying that it's in uh, RAMA or up you, uh, you'd pass. That I'm for. This I'm saying 20 or item three has to be voted on. We're discussing the finite issues with whether or not they're even going to accept new members. And if they are, are they going to be invited? Are they going to be informed of what the conditions are? Let's find out what they want to do with it themselves. I, I don't read anything into what they're doing with new membership other than CPACG is working on it, has a couple of people working on it. And some of the people they are talking to are Fountain. Uh, they have had a they have had an individual talk or conversation with Woodland Park, I understand. And I don't even know where that went, but the attorneys have laid out what the timelines are and why they are. And that's why I'm for, let's finalize at least item through three, recommend that we go with 2022 and the fallout according with to items two and four. I'm done. <laughs> this is Joan. Um, we're, we're spinning wheels here. If mm -hmm. the board wants 22, then regardless of what we say, like Jim said, unless it's some overarching great argument, they're going to go with 22. So I don't see the need to keep beating that to death. I haven't heard a thing said about a positive or negative recommendation. Um, and so... Jim, uh, the 22. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just saying that let, let's go with 22. I mean, that mm -hmm. seems to be the consensus. And, and I, I don't I don't yeah, and if that's where the board wants to go, that's where we're all ultimately. Uh, well, I don't think, I think there are more important issues. I'm sorry, if the board wants to go to 22, that's ultimately where we're going to go. Okay. Jim, it's Rick. Yes, sir. <clears throat> A procedural question. Um, we're, we're talking, uh, uh, I have a uh, cartoon image of, of a fully decorated Christmas tree that, if we, uh, it looks like, <laughs> well, I guess I'd recommended, recommend that we vote on each ornament instead of the fully loaded Christmas tree. Yes, all right. <clears throat> okay, so, so um, and maybe it's just one or two or three ornaments today, but, but not to wait uh, two or three or four months until we fully loaded the Christmas tree and then have an up or down vote on the fully loaded Christmas tree. Um, okay. So I'll just throw it out there since we're just at just covering this one. Um, what year? Uh, is, is it fair to say a consensus would be 2022 for the CAC? Yes. The I say yes. 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 Any, I would uh, vote in opposition, but that's me. Okay. Well, it, it's a it's a majority rule. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, all right. So, I, question, Jim. Yeah. Does that count? As, does that count as our first ornament on the tree? Yes. Twenty-two. I yeah. I would like I would like it noted that I was in opposition, though. Okay. I don't normally say names. I just say there was an, 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 an opposition to that one. That's fine. That's fine. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So item three is done. 22. All right. <clears throat> um, we had a lot of discussion on item two. Uh, I'm sorry. Item three was done. 
had a lot of discussion on the my notes for a B list. So all those in favor of an a B list like we have it now, an A alphabetized A B list. Yes. 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 I. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Wait. Oh, wait. Hold on. Yes. All right. Let Let me. So, how about um, all those opposed to an A B list as we have it now? As we have it now, I oppose. Okay. One oppose. Okay. All right. How many people on A B list by member? Well, if you just had this last vote, um, is that even a valid question to ask now? Uh, because everybody just said keep the A B list as it is was the majority except for me so why would we then vote on a question of a and b by jurisdiction jim is the better question to, to revise the the sentence in the ballot that says no member can go to a b until all the a's are completely funded is is the your question to the cac should that sentence be revised that that each member can individually go to the B after they completely fund their A's? Um, Mr. Godfrey, uh, Carlos here, I think those are separate questions. One is an A, B list or priority list among the member governments. The other one is how we take items off the B list and move them up or uh, promote them in light of, let's say, we either complete the A list items or there's a grant or something. I think those are two separate questions and I think we should address them separately. And I think Rick's is the third, actually, because um, uh, you could have you could have an A B list, but you remove the sentence that says everybody's got to do. Well, that implies that right. a, a member government could go to their B list once they finish with their A, right? What it would seem like. Right. Yes. Right, right now, the ballot says all the A's of all five members have to be completely funded before anybody can go to a B. So I think that's a separate micro issue is do you want to revise that sentence to allow each independent member the option of going to their B if they completely fund their A? That's a separate well, question. From well, it, it, well, it's a little bit different. If we have a comprehensive, I'm sorry. Uh, Jim? Can you yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. If we have a comprehensive A and B list, it doesn't make a distinction on the ballot between the member entities. Then they have some wording in there that member entities can then prioritize uh, items uh, uh, from, or, or will we complete the A list? Then, then there's going to be some conflicts in, in the ballot language because the ballot language doesn't say anything or it's not clear as to how members prioritize their individual projects. So if we have an A and B list that everybody has, and I'm going to, by the way, A and B, so I'm going to include the regional collaborative projects, the things we work on together, like West Avenue Action Plan and Black Forest widening. I'm going to include that in there too. But if we have just one list and then we uh, put in language here about member governments, that could be confusing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Yes. This is Jennifer. Yes, ma'am. Um, may I suggest that maybe um, this whole issue and, and um, Rick called it a micro issue um, uh, in relationship to the A and B list and, and moving things up or things having to be complete. Um, may I maybe make a suggestion that maybe we um, uh, as uh, government entities, this, the city and the county staff and, and any other who want to participate, maybe have a separate conversation about that and come to you with a recommendation in regards to that? It's perfectly fine for me. Yeah, you're, the guys, works for me. you're the guys that have to deal with this. And, and as you pointed out, as Mike and, and Gail and then I pointed out, the engineering flexibility, I don't feel comfortable <clears throat> 
and I think we've stayed away from this as an organization. I don't feel comfortable telling an entity what they should or should not do. I'm not qualified to make that statement. Um, and so um, uh, having input from you guys is, is encouraged. Yeah, I would suggest maybe, hopefully we have time this month and then come back to you. I, I, think, um, I think what we're hearing and what we heard a consensus of, and I don't wanna put any, is that there, you know, to have an A and a B list. Um, and, and I think that we want to provide as much flexibility on that as, as we can, but also make sure that we have the guardrails so that we uh, meet the expectations of the citizens of what projects we put on the ballot. Well, so, uh, well, well said. Suggestion. Yeah. Well, well said, Jennifer. That's exactly right. Thank and, you, this Jennifer. Is Rick. Jennifer, would you also uh, want to meet with your counterparts at the city and talk about the conditions for moving a B to an A, uh, the Carlos's issue that that's also on our list? Um, conditions for and process, such as a supermajority, or it's got to be unanimous of that member, or some other process, would you want to talk to your city counterparts about that, that issue too? I think that is a great issue to discuss. Yeah, if, if, if that's something that the CAC wants to kind of assign to the member governments to do, I think that those are kind of great things that, you know, um, you know, rather than you guys spending a lot of time here, maybe we spend some time and come back with um, some recommendations and 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 we may not even agree on those, but at least we can maybe come uh, to you with some um, some thoughts. Hi, this is Anne. I read that somewhere, didn't I? That you were all inviting uh, that kind of input. You know, just I'm speaking from Green Mountain Falls, really. But uh, is that what you're talking about, Jennifer? Some of. Um, you know, an entity having, you know, the governing body of that little entity having some input as to what they think is needed? Well, I think it's been discussed um, that, yes, they should have, and that's, and that's kind of why we all are on this committee as a, as a member representing that committee, those, those communities. But it's, um, it's, in my mind, it, it's, it's, um, we're we're not fully qualified to make a to make too many of those recommendations to an engineering staff and people that deal with this stuff every day. Uh, there's a lot of professionals on this group that are involved yep. in that kind of stuff. Um, but yep. Jennifer, but Jennifer, I would I would welcome input from um, the the entity staffs um, on this. Uh, so if anybody's listening, yes, please. I would like I would like that. Good. Um, all right, in the interest of time, folks, it's going on four o'clock. Um, this, as I, I want to just reemphasize um, what the leadership of the board uh, has asked us to do, and that is, is to dig into the IGAs, um, dig into our bylaws and rules, and look for things that are, are good, and maybe they don't need changing, but also look for things that, um, based on our experiences uh, to date, uh, things that could be changed and made better. Um, look at restrictions. Should restrictions be opened up? Or do we need those guardrails, as Jennifer said? Do we, do we need some of those guidelines um, <clears throat> it, in order to protect the interests of the public that, that voted on this? And so I would encourage you to take an opportunity, dig into the IGAs, dig into some of the bylaws and the rules. Um, Rick has all of that kind of stuff um, in terms of what, what uh, our uh, board policies are, um, any of that kind of thing that, um, and if where you think something could be better, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be on this list. Um, so if they want to, they want to just open things up, look at it, and we may decide to keep things the same. But uh, I encourage you to do a little bit of homework. I know some of you do, and, and we all are busy. Um, but uh, 
look through that and think of things that you could make better and we'll, we'll take those up to the board. So uh, any parting comments here? Jim, I've got a couple. Gene Gray. Go ahead, Gene. Um, two items. One, looking at the PPRTA numbers, there's two items on there that uh, just on the surface don't make any sense to me and why things haven't been zeroed out. Roadway safety and traffic operations still has, I'm going to use round numbers, $215,000 left in PPRTA 1. Pikes Peak Greenway Improvements has 41,000 left. And both of those are identical lists on the PPRTA 2, and more money has been spent on PPRTA 2 in these two areas than what is left in PPRTA 1. Doesn't make any sense. This, that money should have already been spent, and here we are six years into PPRTA 2. Uh, there's um, a third, third one, which is Mark Shuffle. I sort of understand that, but... Um, that's sort of looming out there since there's only about, there's 60% of those funds un, unspent. But the two that really stand out to me are the roadway safety and traffic and the Pikes Peak Greenway. So just to answer your question, during the budget amendment, or maybe right before it, all the little tiny bits of money in PPRTA 1 were transferred to those three projects. And the Pikes Peak Greenway, and Mike might be able to speak to this, although he is not really in charge of that, um, has a project that they're working on. And Roadway Safety and Traffic Ops in PPRTA1 yeah. has a project. And then, of course, Mark Shuffle North is well underway for a certain section I think it's a certain intersection of Mark Shuffle North. So maybe Mike Chavez, if he's still here, can speak uh, to that. I would like to have this discussed at the next meeting, just in the interest of time. Okay, that sounds good. We'll put it on the agenda. All right, thank you. And then the other item, Jim, um, I would like to have somebody give us a presentation as to what state law says pertaining to the distribution of taxes that go into the uh, Colorado Department of Transportation. Because my guess is, is that there's some hooks in there that pertain to how that money is supposed to be distributed. And I don't know that anybody on this board understands what it is, but I do know that the state has had a track record in the past of shortchanging entities outside of Denver at, the, at, at those entities' expense so that they could fund things in Denver. And I'd like to make certain that that's not going on now with um, money going into CDOT. Well, um, the, the PPACG deals with that all the time. Um, and uh, there's probably somebody right there in the building that can talk to that. But I don't know that you're going to change it because it's. <clears throat> um, it's um, it's an ongoing thing, um, so but we'll we can uh, we can ask somebody to come discuss that. I think there's their transportation manager and PPACG as well aware of that. Would you agree with that, uh, Bev and and Rick? Well, I kind of think that we could connect Gene with somebody in our transportation PPACG's transportation yep. department because yep. yep. it is a very very involved process, as you know, Jim, because you, you, yep. you're quite aware of that. And they could talk to Gene and go through the process because it would take a long time to go over it at the CAC level. Yeah, Gene, would that be, would, would, could we start with having, putting in touch with somebody that's knowledgeable of that process? It's all right with me, but if there's other members that would like to get the same information, uh, that might become cumbersome, but I'm fine with that as a starting point. The, the one thing that concerns me is the last time that I'm aware that we had issues like this substantive at the state level had to do with school funding. And until the school districts outside of the Denver metropolitan area 
fully realized what the, it, uh, the scope of the issue was and how bad things were, and then threatened to sue the state over the fact that they weren't getting the funding that they were entitled to by law, nothing changed. And then once that happened, the State Department of Education started reclassifying school districts around the state and providing them more nearly the amount of funding that they had been entitled to for not years, but decades. In the early or late 70s, early 80s, Colorado Springs schools, like in District 11, were classified as rural schools so that they could get less funding. Well, um, Jean, just to let you know, I've been with the PPA, RTA, and so is Rick for 15 years, and this is, we were employees of PPACG, and this is always been an issue yep yep so i think first you should get up to date on what's going on with all the rules policies laws and how ppacg our region works with the colorado department of transportation and then go from there because it would just really be a lot for this CAC to, to digest. It, it's, it's outside our boundaries, <clears throat> but, I can tell you, but I can tell you that all the things you suggested uh, and talked about have been discussed numerous times between PPACG as the Met Metropolitan Planning Agency for the region. Um, they've had that discussion um, it's an ongoing thing and it hadn't changed, so. Well, I think until they can get other areas in the state involved with it, um, it's not gonna, not gonna get solved. But with the size that El Paso County and Colorado Springs is getting, um, we have, we're getting shortchanged on stuff and I'm not so certain that the state isn't violating their own laws and what they're doing, but that's my opinion. Yeah, go to the trans go to the transportation advisory board and make that argument. Yeah, okay, um, everybody. I really appreciate your time. I know it's a long day and it's um, a lot of discussion, um, but um, I'm hoping that um, that this this uh, produces a, a positive um, uh, input to the board for RTA three, and I'm just thankful for the board that they're allowing us to be part of this process. Um, and have these discussions, but I, I do appreciate your time, all of you. Um, so we've already had uh, some topics for the next agenda. Any other communications by any of the members before I adjourn? I just want to ask, how do you raise your hand? Okay. Okay. Um, you can do it one of two ways. Go down. Um, Hold on. Cool. You, can go, you can go down to reactions and yeah. click on a hand or something. One of them is for clapping, but you can do that. The other way, the other way is to go into the chat. Okay. And go into the chat function and send something, just send something to me. Hey, I got an input. Okay. And it pops up on my screen from the chat section. Oh, okay. Thank I've you. I've tried that several times. It doesn't seem to work too well. So just piping in often is the only way to do it. Well, I, hate, I hate doing that. I have to look at it. I have to look at it, Brian. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks. You I guys just say happy good. Labor Day have weekend. Day. Everybody be safe. Have a good, a good Labor Day weekend. And we'll see you next month. Meeting adjourned. Hello. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Hey, Jim. Call me.